Hello, everyone. As you can see, uh, we've gathered uh, in person in the CPR for those board members and administrators who are in town and able to attend. So just bear with us as we iron out a couple of our technical difficulties along the way. So with, with that, though, if I could have everyone rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, so um, I know there's a note posted in the chat on Zoom, but also just to remind everyone about the process that we've been following for these remote meetings. There are two opportunities for community comment on the agenda. When I open those comment periods at that point in time, you can go into the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please put in your name and address, and then you'll be recognized to ask your question, make your comment. Uh, also, uh, since we've run into this in the past, if you are calling in as on a phone or logged in through a different name in your house or something that's not apparent to link your login and as it appears as a participant along with uh, the person who wants to ask a question, please let us know uh, what that is so we can find you easier and promote you to be able to, to speak. Uh, also, you know, as is our usual practice, we try to give everyone an opportunity to speak before we go back around. So if you do make a comment during the first comment period, uh, you will have to wait till the end of the second period before you're, you're recognized because, again, we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to, to speak. At the same time, our usual uh, procedure is to, for comments to try to keep them to three minutes or less. Uh, and one of the comment periods, obviously, is before the presentation. One is after. So to the extent uh, you, you want to wait to hear the presentation and the dialogue between the administration and the board before you're asking your questions, that may be beneficial. Also, uh, for those of you who have been following the announcements from the governor's office uh, last week, he directed all districts to have three public uh, town hall sessions regarding reopening plans. So tonight will serve as the first of those. So in particular, uh, during the second comment period, the, that will be where we are opening it up for people to ask their, their questions for the Q&A portion of what the governor has envisioned. But again, uh, we ask everyone to be mindful of the time and allow the opportunity for as many people who would like to ask questions or make comments as possible. So with that, if I could get a motion to accept tonight's agenda, please. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So with that, Dr. Harrison, over to you for district updates. So good evening, everyone. And I would say that um, I'm actually quite excited for this transition. Uh, in our board meetings. Uh, much like our students, we're going to begin phasing into our uh, traditional school experiences. So tonight, as Mr. Friedman indicated, we have a number of our trustees here present in the CPR with us, um, as well as Ms. Stein and our district clerk, Ms. Davies. Um, and we're going to begin to process um, this transition just as our, our students and faculty will um, throughout um, this fall. Um, there's a lot happening in our school district right now. Um, I've been trying to maintain our contact, regular communication, whether it is my regular letters that are going to home or if it is the um, Facebook live sessions that we are all participating in. Um, but please keep your eyes on our website. Um, most importantly, um, keep an eye on our reopening uh, page as there's going to be regular information posted there. We have a Q&A document or an FAQ document that will be updated on a regular basis with new information as needed. 
I would also draw your attention to a communication that went out today related to transportation. Um, it's a very important survey um, that we need all parents to complete whose children um, participate um, in our participate in transportation or are eligible for transportation in the school district. So please check your, your inbox for that communication and be sure to complete the survey in a timely fashion because that <coughs> data that we received is of critical importance in helping informing our planning of transportation for this fall. Also, I do want to remind everybody uh, to take a look at our capital bond project website. Um, there are continued updates there. Um, there was a communication that I sent out last week um, that provided some updates on our process. Um, while we are experiencing delays as a result of the pandemic and the slowdowns that have occurred in Albany, um, I'm pleased to say that our school district has continued to do its part in meeting all the timelines and objectives that were set. Um, so please check out that web page for more details on where we are in our capital project. Um, of note, the um, one item that we know that we're able to achieve this summer was the installation of new boilers at Dow's Lane, and that is occurring today. Um, so we're, we're moving forward, but we look forward to being able to communicate more progress to the school community in the coming months. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, I know we now have our time for our committee reports. Uh, it's over the summer, so we have not had as many of those meetings as we do during the regular year. But uh, as Dr. Harrison alluded to, we are still moving forward at the Buildings and Grounds Committee with the capital project and looking to uh, obviously get whatever work we can get done now, as Dr. Harrison mentioned, the boiler, and working on trying to sequence work to start during the school year uh, based on once we get approval from SED. Uh, the design work for phase two is underway and I expect sometime in the fall, we'll be back around to the board to present an update on where that design process is once they've uh, gotten past uh, the 30% drawings where it's something that we can start to cost out and look at. So, Ms. Stein, anything that I missed? No, no the, the boilers were going in today and yesterday as we speak. And that was really exciting to see. So the new boiler, so we have that on, on time for September. So we're excited about that. So at least one thing is going really well. And I just remind everyone, trustees, everyone here in the CPR, if we make sure we lean into our microphones and project the folks at home are able to hear us. Thank you. Uh, is, is, Dr. Harrison, is there an update from the safety committee? I would just like to say we haven't had a formal meeting of the safety committee yet, but we have on our on the district website posted the district safety plan, the district wide safety plan. It is on the um, um, the website under several different links. If you search for district safety, it, we're part we're in part of our 30 day comment period at the moment, and um, and then that plan will be adopted by the board prior to the beginning of school. The building-wide safety plans are currently in progress. We're updating them with a couple of different annexes right now. Those are not public documents. Those are documents that the principals and the schools use in order to provide the safety. If those were made public, that would enable um, a perpetrator to potentially know exactly how we're going to respond. So we don't make those public. But the um, district-wide document does give you general ideas of what the kinds of responses that we will be having. So it's a very good document. We're constantly updating that document with the help of our security consultant, Al Taris. Thank you. So uh, here's the point in our agenda where we have our first opportunity for community comment. So if you would like to make a comment at this point in time, uh, please post your name and address in the chat in Zoom, and uh, you'll be then recognized to make your comment again. Uh, Community comment should be limited to three minutes uh, or less, and we ask that uh, you adhere to that so that way we can try to get to as many comments as possible. And again, please put your name and address in the comments since that's uh, board protocol anytime a member from the community 
uh, comes to the mic when we are having these meetings live, uh, you're asked to provide your name and address. So with that, and again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, and we'll turn now to uh, Carolyn Cunard at 221 South Buckout. Caroline, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, so we'll go on to the next one and uh, we'll circle back. Uh, Jennifer Lipman, 56 Manor Pond Lane. Hi, how are you? Thank you everyone for um, all of your hard work so far in putting together the district's reopening plan. I know a lot of work and thought and time has gone into it and I appreciate all of the efforts. My question concerns the um, learning pods and sort of other arrangements families are being forced to make. Um, sorry, I ran upstairs to get away from my children so they wouldn't scream in the background so now I'm out of breath. Um, so uh, my, my question concerns the learning pods. A lot of families are looking for options on the days that their kids have distance learning for ways um, that they can supplement what's going on or get help from other competent adults to oversee their children's distance learning to the extent that the parents both work and have other obligations or other children to watch. And I know, for example, there are some uh, camps and other schools that are offering programs to help kids navigate their distance learning. For example, Mohawk Day Camp is offering hybrid learning pods where the kids can go there and get support um, and you know, also daycare and adult supervision and teacher support in navigating their distance learning. It's my understanding that the Irvington School District has said they do not support these kinds of um, hybrid learning pods and I guess my question is why does the school district not support them if these kind of arrangements would help children um, you know be in a productive learning environment and get through their distance learning and help parents find alternative means of childcare so that the kids can accomplish their distance learning and the parents can accomplish their work. So thank you, Mrs. Lippman, for the question. Uh, so this really comes back to um, multiple um, concerns that we do have in the Irvington schools. First and foremost, there is realistically a capacity that we have to deal with, that we do not have the means um, and resources to be able to communicate what could be with a, a countless number of folks that are organizing different um, learning pods or support structures for their children. I then would also suggest that um, when we think about the health and safety of our students, we are working hard um, and in particular at the elementary level to develop cohort models to avoid the, the spread and um, make sure that we're able to have effective structures and systems in place for a contact tracing. So we certainly don't wanna support that additional mingling that may occur outside of the school day. Um, finally, I would say there's a significant concern in and around equity in our school community. We have to acknowledge the fact that not everybody in our schools has the ability to pay for their participation in a learning pod or to have other levels of support that may supplement that. We are committed to providing the very best experiences to our students, and that is each and every one of our students every day, regardless of the socioeconomics they may have in their household or a family's interest or ability to provide 
their participation in a pod. So our full commitment is to providing high quality learning experiences through the learning plans that we have um, developed that have been communicated with the school community this evening. Um, we are going to um, talk about some other opportunities that we're either going to extend to families to support their wishes or um, other opportunities that we're exploring looking to enhance learning experience for experiences for our students. But simply stated, um, it is not something that we have the capacity to support. Um, and I, I have significant concern about equity and access for all students in our school community. Thank you. So next we have Richard Farino, 25 Eunice Court. Hello. Um, so yeah, I had a question about the um, plan for reopening. Um, <clears throat> for people who have a situation where they do have the ability to care for children at home, it didn't seem to me, and it was a little confusing, but it, it didn't seem to me like there was a 100% remote option available. Uh, what I read was about the hybrid option. Um, I think what I've seen in the city and in some districts in Long Island is they're offering a 100% remote option and then certain periods to opt in to start to send your child uh, two days a week. Um, so I guess what I, my, my real question stems from the idea that, you know, if you have the ability to keep your children at home, could you, you know, slowly introduce them, you know, as time has gone on? I think that the concern that people have is just generally, this feels like a little bit of an experiment and it's gonna have to be, but you know, if you don't have to be part of the experiment, then, then maybe it would be good to not be part of it. Um, and my fear is obviously that there's some sort of a, an outbreak of some sort early days and I could avoid that. Uh, I, what I don't wanna have to do is if I don't send my child right away, then I would not be potentially enrolled for the rest of that year. That doesn't, that's certainly not something I'm interested in. So sorry if that was a little rambling, but I'm just curious about what specifically we can do in terms of a 100% remote option with some sort of periodic opt-in to in-person schooling. Great, thank you, Mr. Farina, for your, your question. Um, I would suggest that um, folks that are interested in, in such an opportunity, um, as well as those that have interest in looking at um, expanded in-school learning time for our youngest students, to, to hang on tight, because that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, we are gonna talk about such opportunities that will be extended. I also want to highlight um, some differences that do exist in our distance learning plan um, or our reopening plan that in that plan we have prepared for full on return to school if conditions are um, of, of such a nature that it is safe for everyone to return to school. And so that's one model. Second model is the hybrid model which we must implement because we have to reduce the density in our schools. We have to be sure that we can provide for the necessary social distancing and we cannot have everyone in school, um, just simple staff and um, space limitations. Um, the third scenario that is outlined in our distance, our reopening plan is 100% distance learning. And I wanna separate that from the request that Mr. Farino and many others have had in the school community that 100% distance learning plan, it's similar to what we had experienced back in the spring beginning on March 16th. That would be implemented in the event that we had to close a school or all of our schools because of health concerns. So what is being asked now is for a different scenario, which we will discuss later in our presentation this evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harrison. For that, I, I will also say that, uh, as Dr. Harrison mentioned, that this and some other topics that the community has been discussing are going to be addressed uh, in the course of the presentation. You're certainly free to ask questions now, but I, I do think if uh, people have questions on those specific issues, that they wait until they hear the presentation and the board discussion before asking questions on that. You will be certainly afforded time to ask questions at the end of the presentation. But, uh, and again, as I mentioned, anyone who does wish to speak now, uh, you may not be afforded the opportunity 
later since we do want to get everyone to have the opportunity to speak before we recognize anyone who has spoken al already. So with that, uh, I see we have Eugenia Spector at 32 Richmond Hill. Hi, good evening, how are you? Fine, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, my husband and I just wanna make a brief comment, thank you. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. And again, thank you for all the work that's being done uh, on, on the school. Uh, and, uh, just in the interest of time, potentially after the presentation, and sorry to be repetitive, just to spend 15 seconds on a question, which is very similar to the ones that was brought up about, uh, again, the option of having distance learning with a slightly different point, just to add, one is there certain is some circumstances where a particular family has a you know reason for um, the child sort of not to go to school uh, just from a family perspective that could be kind of one reason for the need to do that. Um, I mean we're also thinking that particularly in the beginning of this school year, the kids themselves may also need to be given a little bit more time or or even in some cases maybe are not fully comfortable going quite yet and, and hopefully that option also gives the school themselves an opportunity essentially to have fewer kids in school at, at any given time. So I don't want to reiterate the things already were brought up and I know it will be covered later, uh, but just wanted to bring that point back to, to everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say a couple of things in response. Uh, you know, a, you know, we've been talking about this for now a while at board meetings, and as we've said all along, this is to be an evolving process. We'll be continuing to get guidance from the state education department and health departments and all other <coughs> excuse me, information that we take into account in formulating these plans. So, you know, our process is continually evolving, but to that end, we also, uh, I should note that there's always been, as part of the state plans, if there is a documented medical need for students to be able to have a 100% remote option for medical reasons. And though the frameworks that we've been operating in is that the state has said that the district should look first to plans that bring the kids back into school. So that's the framework that we've been operating in along is that since the state has said that is what districts should be focusing on, and the governor last week said that schools can open, that has obviously been uh, an area of focus is making sure we can meet that requirement. But as uh, Dr. Harrison alluded to, those who are interested in the 100% remote option, uh, that will be discussed uh, during the presentation. Thank you. Next we have Kelly Turner, 130 Deer Track Lane. Hi there. Um, thanks for giving us a chance to comment and thank you all for all the hard work that you've been doing on the reopening plan. I'm a working mother and part of a household where my husband and I both work. So the reopening plan has been hard for us to digest. Um, I've been meeting and talking with a group of about 20 other working parents and we all sort of gather our thoughts and I put them together in a petition on change.org yesterday um, for our district, for Dow's Lane parents especially. And we actually have 273 signatures already, but basically what we wanted to really hear from the board um, and discuss hopefully a little further is what exactly, like, like the precise details, <laughs> What exactly is preventing us um, as, a, as a school, Dow's Lane, these, these young five to eight year olds, what's preventing us from doing an AM PM hybrid model, just like seven other schools in the Hudson Valley are doing, including Scarsdale, Edgemont, and Dobbs Ferry. Um, in our opinion, the people who signed this petition, we believe that we should really do everything possible to not have kids ages five through eight learning from screens three days a week. Um, and the proposal of AM PM would maintain the same amount of virus exposure that is in the two-day, three-day model, but it would keep our young kids off of screens almost entirely. Um, in our suggested proposal, 
we're only suggesting that specials be offered online. Um, so we know that busing is the main hurdle to the AM PM solution at Dazzling. And so my main, our main question is, what exactly is the extra cost of this midday bus route? So what is the cost of it? And two, if enough parents were willing to opt out of just the midday pick up and drop off, how significantly could we reduce that cost? Because if it's something that we could perhaps raise through parent donation drive, uh, like a fundraising drive, then um, 273 other parents like me would, would really um, feel that the AM PM split is beneficial. Um, I also did suggest that we live stream the AM, AM um, classes so that any immunocompromised families could do 100% distance learning if that's what they need for the, the safety of their family. So again, what is the cost of the busing for the midday pickup? And if we got enough parents to carpool, could we significantly reduce that cost to make it affordable for the district? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this is also something that will be the focus of discussion later after the, the presentation. So I, I don't want to jump ahead of that, but I think there's more to come on that. Uh, I, I, I will say that uh, busing is certainly a, a challenge, and in particular, looking at AMPM models uh, district-wide, uh, that is a significant hurdle. It also presents a challenge for individual schools. I'll also uh, just caution everyone, while every district is publishing their plans and coming out with what they're doing, every district is somewhat unique in terms of their space, their resources. Many districts don't have busing, which then is a consideration that they don't have to deal with. Uh, we do provide busing uh, in order, we can't change that by law. We'd required to have a public referendum on busing if we were looking to you know, change or eliminate busing. That I'm not saying adding a midday bus would fall within that, but if there's been discussion I know of elimination of busing, that is something that would require a full community vote. So uh, I just wanna say that uh, we're certainly aware of was going on in the region. Dr. Harrison, as he's mentioned at other board meetings, participates in discussions with both the Quad Villages, that's Ardsley, Dobbs, Ferry, and Hastings on a regular basis, and is also active in regional and statewide discussions about different plans and different options. So, uh, you know, the district has received and has looked at lots of different options, but what we may hear about in one district may not uh, be something that Irvington can accomplish for various reasons. But as I said, more on that to come. Of course, now my computer's frozen, so. Well, I want me to go to the next. Yeah, if you can tell, say who's next. Gemma Hart, Jay. Um, hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I actually basically wanted to ask the same question that was previously asked by Kelly. Um, we have a son who is going into first grade and um, my husband and I already wrote to Dr. Harrison to express our concerns around the current hybrid model and having a child who's not even six yet spend three days in front of the screen. So. Hopefully that that will be something that we can address through this presentation. I would really love to hear um, Dr. Harrison's response and thoughts on that. It sounds like that's coming. Um, so I won't belabor that, but um, one other thing is if we do move ahead with the hybrid model, um, would it be possible for our children to stay in the same classes as they had last year? Because then as we're looking to work through the hybrid model, and from a safety perspective, think about the children that our own children will be with potentially on the three days when they're not in school. Um, knowing who the children are, knowing the parents um, would certainly be just very helpful for us in trying to organize what is going to be complicated for working parents. So maybe that's something that uh, you guys could address with the presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Christy Vincent, 15 North Dutcher Street. Hi there, everyone. 
Um, I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate um, everything that this board has been doing for our, our children. So um, I, I want to make sure that's acknowledged up front. Um, I do have a question. Uh, if, if we move forward with the hybrid plan that is on the books, what is the evaluation process and timeline to reassess this initial approach? So really what I'm getting at here is what is the data and information that we will use to decide if we have to course correct and change direction and when will we be looking to reassess? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think when we think about the data and the model that we have in place, it's not a matter of necessarily looking at the approach for instructional um, delivery and student learning that may be the top priority right now. This is about health and safety. So as you will see in the coming days, um, we are going to be uploading more information uh, to our website specific to the monitoring of student and staff health and the determination about where we would have look at the evolution of our plans, the possible um, drawback of the, the, the withdrawal of the number of students that may be attending school or the increase of the number of students attending school will be driven by data in our region and experience here locally in the Irvington schools. Um, with respect to the overall learning experience, um, that is something that we will certainly um, gather feedback from parents, um, our older students and faculty and staff throughout the, the course of the experience and to seek opportunities uh, for enhancement where necessary. Thank you. Uh, next we have Ashley Nielsen, 30 Woodlawn Avenue, Tarrytown. Hi. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, thank you for listening to all these questions. I know that you guys address a lot in the actual presentation, but I just, after reading the email that was sent, I just, um, I had a question about, there's going to be three meetings, and um, I, I thought that I read that um, we should be submitting our questions for each meeting after this one before we have the meetings, does that mean we won't be able to submit questions after the meetings, um, the next meetings that we have, or will it be an open forum? That's my biggest question. Thank you. So with my communication earlier today, um, the intention was to not only um, put those dates on your calendar for you to be able to attend but was for, to provide the opportunity for you to provide questions in advance that would help inform the development of my presentation. Um, by doing so, I'm hopeful that I will be able to answer a lot of the questions throughout the initial presentation. And following that period of time, there will be Q&A. So there will be opportunity to ask questions. Um, but again, the collection of the questions in advance um, was with the intent of efficiency and thoroughness and wanting to make sure that I'm serving your needs and answering the questions that you may have in our school community. Um, so there will be opportunity um, for Q&A, uh, but um, you know, certainly I wanna be prepared and I want us to all be efficient and respectful of one another's time to make sure it is a very productive meeting on next Thursday night at 7 p.m. and then the following Thursday, um, the 20th at 9 a.m. Thank you, Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. Very welcome. Next, we have Sarah Parganos, 90 Fargo Lane. Go ahead, please. Jay, is Ms. Parganos in? I do not see her in the. So while you're looking for her, do you yeah, while we look for her, um, next we have Ross Vincent. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, also please provide your address when you do so.
Ross, you should be able to unmute. My question was asked earlier on, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay, have you been able to find Ms. Parganos? Not at this time. Okay, so we'll go on next to Diana Ozluski to East Home Place. Yeah, hi. Um, I, it's pronounced Oshetsky, and I know anyone wouldn't get that, but I just had a brief question, which hopefully comes up in the in the you know at some point in the presentation. Uh, but you know, last week we had this big storm. And I lost internet and a lot of the people lost power um, that dragged on for like a week. Um, and it just, the prospect of having virtual learning was a little bit troubling with it. <laughs> so I was just wondering what the plan was in the event of a storm where people lose internet and or power for an extended period of time, like, you know, three to five days to a week. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, thank you for your comment. I, I think you, you raise a good point. Um, but I, I would actually see this as an opportunity rather than a challenge that may be before us based upon the distance learning structures that we have in place. When we would have a storm such as that, typically our schools would be closed to learning entirely. However, there may be opportunities for us to be able to provide student learning. We foresee a storm uh, uh, that is coming down the path. There could be learning that is posted for students in advance of the storm. Um, so, for example, you know, many folks may not be aware that, you know, there were several people in our community that um, through today still did not have power. We did not have power at Dow's Lane or the district office, but we could have provided some opportunities and resources to support learning for those students that did have access and continue to support learning where we may otherwise have had to close uh, schools. So I recognize some challenges that could exist with connectivity. However, those challenges would have been present uh, regardless of uh, whether we're utilizing digital platforms to support learning or if we were 100% in-person learning. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Stephanie Rodnick, 49 Westwood Circle. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Great. I just wanted to know if in tonight's presentation or if you want to talk about, Dr. Harrison, um, the air filtration systems that are going to be upgraded in all of the buildings in the school, whether it be the campus or Dow's Lane or Main Street School, I know that there's a recommended MERV 13 filter or something. And I just wanted to make sure that that's gonna be handled with, with, um, with facilities, et cetera. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yes, we will be providing more details on the work that we'll be doing at the front in future presentations and posting information on the website. Um, but we have ordered uh, MERV 13 filters for all air handling systems in the school district and they um, almost all of them have arrived and are in stock and we'll be installing them before school begins. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, at th th this point, if there was anyone else who wanted to make a public comment, uh, I'm not seeing any more names and addresses uh, posted. As a reminder, we don't read comments that are posted in the chat uh, everything is collected and seen, but if you want to make a public comment, you just need to put your name and address in the chat and then you'll be recognized. At this point, I'm gonna suggest that we move forward with the presentation and people will have an opportunity to ask their questions at the end at, at this point. So, so uh, Dr. Harrison, uh, I turn it over to you for your presentation. So good evening once again, everyone. Um, so when we start and think about where we are, and as Brian had referenced earlier, this has been quite a process. But at the start of this process, the one thing that I had stated to the community that is written into our uh, reopening plan is that this was going to be a plan and a process that was going to evolve. 
what I committed to the community was that we were going to seek and respect your feedback. We were going to utilize our experiences and our feedback to help our plans evolve. Um, and this um, present, presentation this evening, um, the conversations that we will have, I believe will be a reflection of that. And um, we certainly know that we won't be able to satisfy the needs of or the interests of everyone at all times. However, uh, we are doing our best to provide the top quality experience for all of our students while being mindful of the health and safety of our students and staff. So this evening, the structure of my presentation is I want to recap and reiterate some of the things that we've already talked about it it's about. So we our community members have a clear, concise picture of what we have discussed, what is included in our plan to date. And then I want to venture into discussing some new content and new ideas and initiatives that are evolving based upon our experience, as I said, and based upon the feedback of the parent community, and I should say, our wonderful faculty and staff as well. So as we work through this process, we established a series of four guiding principles. These principles grounded all the work that we are doing here in our school district. First and foremost is that focus on safety and well-being of all of, all of our students and employees. We want to make sure that we are promoting equity, equity and accessibility for all of our students throughout the district. We want to make sure that we have instructional delivery that meets the needs of our students. And then we have an obligation to address the social and emotional needs of our students and all of our employees. That said, through the course of the recent um, presentations, we have proposed a hybrid schedule um, that we are implementing in September. This model, um, as displayed before you, has students broken into cohorts where we are looking at students in cohort A attending on a Monday and Tuesday, cohort B attending Thursday and Friday. All students will be participating in uh, distance learning when not in school. And the Wednesday, where we've labeled it as a flex day, is an opportunity um, where we'll have all students learning from home. There will be distance learning that will occur throughout that day. It'll look a little different in elementary schools and secondary schools. Elementary schools, there will be regular school experiences. There will be whole class instruction and activities that may occur. There may be small groups, specials may occur during this period of time. Then when we think about the high school and middle school environment, we're looking at opportunities where we are going to rotate our school schedule. So on Wednesdays, the picture of week one, period zero through four will meet. And then the following week or week two, you would see periods five through nine meet. Um, also on that day, we are gonna set aside two and a half hours for committee meetings, professional learning and necessary collaboration. I must underscore the essential nature of this time and it's a commitment that I have made to our faculty and staff because this is very difficult work. Teaching in this hybrid model in any kind of remote model is new and requires significant planning, professional learning, and a great deal of collaboration among teachers. If we wanna see our students succeed, if we wanna see the most come out of this experience, this is essential and it's something that I stand by and have dedicated to our teachers that we will provide. So when we looked at the development of the cohorts, we needed to make sure that we are meeting the necessary Department of Health guidelines for health and safety that we were looking at the state education department guidelines regarding serving students with the highest needs. We also were looking at meeting all the different course requests wherever possible at the secondary level. So in the development of cohorts, um, very simplistically in looking at the difference between A and B, we broke them down alphabetically. And the reason for doing so is we wanted to provide for common schedules and routines in houses wherever possible or in homes wherever possible. 
So here we think about siblings and we would want them to be in a similar cohort regardless of what, which school they were in to be able to really be partners um, with parents um, and try to support them. And then we look at cohort C, which are students that are in special classes. Um, these are students with, uh, that have special learning needs. And in looking at this, recognizing the needs that they have, we're looking at having them in school for an extensive period of time and looking at that continuity of four to five days a week. So in order to meet all these guidelines, there may be some needs for shifts here and there, that there may have to be a couple class or schedule changes along the way. If that does occur, I hope that it's minimal um, and you would receive communication specifically from the school. We also at the last meeting talked about the need for a phased in reopening. We wanna do this well. We wanna make sure that our teachers are ready. We wanna make sure that our school facilities are ready. And we wanna provide a healthy transition for our students socially and emotionally back into learning. So that said, the first week of September, the week following Labor Day, we are going to have 100% distance learning. The second week, the 14th through the 18th, we're gonna transition into our alternating attendance model or the hybrid model, where we will see approximately a quarter of the students on each of the four days where we would have in-person learning. This will provide significant opportunity for us to teach uh, the routines and expectations and all the safety protocols that will be in place in our schools and utilizing transportation effectively. And by doing so, we will be able to have a really a smooth, safe opening to our school year. Um, then we look to the third week of September, which would be the, the week of the 21st. Here, we would kick in our full week of distance uh, or alternating attendance or hybrid learning model. So this is an illustration of what that would look like. And um, here, um, I want to draw your attention really just to how it pans out. So if we look at the, the second week, the week of the 14th, you can see that cohort A on the Monday and Tuesday are split into two groups. So rather than having approximately 50% of our students in attendance on a given day, we will have 25% attendance on those days. That will provide us with the opportunity to give a lot of care to our students in supporting their transition to school, both socially and emotionally, as well as learning the protocols, routines. There's gonna be lots of time. We're gonna to have to go through tours of the buildings to understand how traffic patterns have shifted, how, uh, where water fountains are that you're able to utilize, understand the traffic flows and stairways to get used to new lunch routines uh, and so on. So that reduced density will be critical. And then when we look at the week of the 21st, we then, uh, the week of the 21st, we kick into that full uh, AB model that we have talked about. And then the following week, we do have a modification. And this is a good example of where that flex day will be useful for us as a school district. We recognize that uh, we have a number of holidays that fall throughout the year on Mondays. There are a couple that may fall on Fridays. So when those events occur, or we have an election day, for example, we'll be able to pivot and adjust that week so we don't have students that will lose out on a day of the in-person learning by modifying the schedule. So see, in this case, um, we look at the Wednesday Flex days essentially dropped, and we have two days of in-person learning for both cohorts of students. So when we think about distance, when we think about distance learning, um, we need to think about what it means here. And I really want to dispel uh, any myths that may be there, and that I want us to think about um, that the experiences that we had in the spring were essentially emergency plans. We have learned from those experiences. We are in a stronger place than we were then, pedagogically, um, in our thinking, our thinking and just how to approach children and managing the day. And technologically, we're much more savvy. So here, when we think about this, we'll have all students participating in regular scheduled synchronous instruction following an assigned schedule. So what I want you to think of here, if we were in a position where we had to unfortunately close an entire school or we had to close the district. Students would follow a regular schedule that would be defined by the school. 
the easiest way to think about this would be think about that traditional secondary schedule where there's a period one, two, three, four. A student would flow through that schedule following the hours of the regular school day with the exception of the Wednesday and would have synchronous learning experiences each period of the day. Similarly, at the elementary level, there will be a structured school day that will provide that level of instruction, student-teacher interaction, whole group instruction, as well as small group instruction. And there will be need and opportunity for asynchronous learning. And we have to be mindful that this is something that does occur in a regular school day when all students are here 100% of the time. Um, we also want to say that when students at home may be able to interact with our students and teachers here in the classroom during the lesson. Um, we've talked about uh, how we are going to provide streaming from our classrooms as a resource to support learning, but we also recognize that teachers will be able to use our Google suite of applications. And in doing so, through Google Meet, we'll have opportunities for, for chatting and conversation and that will go back and forth between teachers and students who are home and those that are in school. So as I referenced a moment ago, so while participating in distance learning, we recognize that we will have um, live streaming from the classroom. This live streaming will be a shot of the front of the classroom. Um, it will be streamed um, to every home. It'll go through Google Classroom. Folks on the outside will not be able to see it. Only children in that particular class will be able to observe it. Um, it will not include images of students in classrooms, only the front of the classroom, uh, teacher workstation, the smart board on the teacher. We'll utilize Google Classroom and Google Meet to support instruction and to maintain ongoing communications. Um, and there will be other opportunities um, that using Google and other um, software and apps that we utilize to be able to support um, other aspects of instruction. Um, with all this in mind, there's some policies, um, particularly on the, on the technology side that where we're going to have to make some adjustments. Um, we're looking to make those adjustments throughout the course of this week and we'll post them on the district website for com any community comment. Um, but small minor tweaks that recognize the shift in our experiences for our students and the shift in expectations that will have to go along with that. So when we think about distance learning, I want to reiterate the fact that all students are going to have a structured school day. This means that all of our students are going to have to attend all of their classes that are on their schedule. And that's elementary and secondary students. Attendance will be taken and participation will be monitored. This is not just a requirement of the Irvington schools. It is a requirement of the state of the New York, the state of New York to ensure that our students have appropriate seat time to earn credit to move forward from one grade to the next. Students are going to be evaluated and assessed in traditional fashions and are gonna receive the normal grades that would be received during the course of a traditional school experiences. Our students will interact with the teacher and classmates throughout this entire experience. And it's going to be a different type of experience again than you had in the spring. Here it's gonna be a combination of live streamed instruction, watching recorded videos, completing independent work, small group meetings with teachers, and so on. When we think about elementary specials, some of them will happen remotely. Uh, it's inevitable but we are going to look to rotate our specials throughout the course of the experience to make sure that students don't always have, say, art remotely based upon their cohort and their schedule. We're going to look to take students outdoors whenever possible. For example, physical education will be one such experience where we'll be able to take advantage of that wherever possible. That flex day, again, is going to provide for opportunities for different types of um, direct instruction, small group learning, and individual support, as well as necessary independent work for our students. So when we think about distance learning, um, there's going to be reminders that we have to put out there for everybody in our school community. So when we think about our students, they're going to have to be responsible and prepared, just as they would be during the school day. We need to log into Google Meet at the, the assigned times or scheduled time. Mute your microphones when you're not speaking. Device cameras 
must be turned on while in a class. And I want to say that there's a lot of new features that are being rolled out this week with Google Meet. And for those that, that don't want to display what's going on behind them, you'll be able to put up um, a background so that you would have privacy and it would just be you with your class. You remain in a Google meeting only if a teacher is present. So if a meeting ends, a student needs to leave as well. Students should come to any remote experience ready for learning, just as they would for class. When appropriate, they can use the chat function to ask a question, to provide responses. They need to make sure that they're always respectful to the teacher and the other students. And as a reminder, that the district code of conduct is something that is in full effect regardless of the mode of learning that we're under. Finally, and this is a reminder that I, unfortunately I have on the next slide as well, there is to be no recording of any kind by students or parents. So within the platforms that we use, such as Google Meet, from home, you would not be able to record that. If you tried to record it from your, your device where you were logged in, it would, an alert would be sent to the teacher that is hosting that, that meet. Additionally, any photo images, any other recording devices are not permitted. And I ask that everyone respect that for the privacy of our teachers and for our students. And understand that unfortunately, we would have to deal with consequences if and when we found out that something like that occurred. So for parents and guardians, we too have to ask you to follow some rules, to be our partners in this work. So we need you to help by providing a quiet space, free from distractions for your children to learn. Encourage your child to be as independent as possible. Don't sit next to your child and coach them through their learning experiences. Allow them to venture into the experience themselves, allow them to struggle at times, because that's what happens in the school day, and we need to make sure we mimic that at home. Allow teachers to work with all students. If your child needs some additional support beyond what is being offered, have them sign up, sign up for some time that the teacher may be offering, or reach out to the teacher and request some assistance. We ask that you respect the privacy of all students and refrain from participating in any kind of lesson or discussing anything that you may observe or overhear hear during a live class session. If you need to speak to a teacher during a meet, isn't the time to do it. Please reach out to them using email and the teachers will respond to you in a timely manner. And again, that reminder that recording is not permitted. So as we've talked about along the way, 100% uh, distance learning was not an option that we had extended to families, an option that would be available in lieu of the hybrid model that I just reviewed. According to the guidance as outlined by New York State Education Department, it's not presented as something that school districts have to provide. However, where it is referenced is students that have medical needs, where districts could offer that as a medical accommodation. We certainly need more guidance to implement such a plan here. You know, when we think about doing this in Irvington, we worry about the nature of requirements that may be forthcoming if they do arrive or not. We wanna make sure that we are fulfilling the obligations that we have for the State Education Department and New York State. We wanna make sure that attendance meets the 180 day New York State requirement that students have all the seat time that is guaranteed to them and that they earn the necessary time to be able to move on from one grade to the next. So as has been discussed in a, a number of emails and referenced in some of the comments in prior meetings, yes, other districts are doing this. Other districts have stepped forward and thought, geez, we're gonna do it anyhow and hadn't considered consequences there. Um, and I um, always am cautious. I wanna make sure that we're doing the right thing for our children. I wanna make sure that we're protecting our school district. However, having really heard the feedback from our parent community and understanding the challenges and concerns that may be present, 
Um, I am going to step forward and recommending that we implement a 100% distance learning option for our school community. So, but in doing so, I want us to be mindful of the differences in these experiences. We have to set expectations. I feel I have to manage what you're thinking you may receive in such an experience. That we know it is not the same level of experience that has afforded our children in an in-person learning experience. Hence the belief, hence the model that we have here where we have students coming to school for in-person learning. Distance learning has been documented to have some negative effects on social and emotional learning due to the limited personal interaction. However, I do acknowledge that there's evidence that some students that struggled in school during in-person learning have excelled during distance learning. There are limitations on learning that is interactive, such as those things that are hands-on and those that engage students physically, such as the arts, science labs, PLTW or STEM learning, physical education, that there's limited flexibility with scheduling at the secondary level, that we also have to worry about those inequities that I referenced before and wanting to make sure that all of our students have available access to the supports that would be had during the school day and not making the assumption that students at home are gonna have the same level of support as all those students that would be coming to school two days a week. When we think about our teachers, they are an incredible group. They're a group that is working tirelessly throughout the course of the summer to prepare for the reopening of school. But there's limitations on the availability that they have to be able to support the needs of students that are in school and students that would be 100% on a distance learning model. There's simply not enough time in the day to think that there can be added attention or special structures created to be able to support those only from working from home. So when we think about this, um, recognizing the challenges, I also recognize what a difficult time this is for all of us. I recognize that we're all facing very important and challenging decisions that we've never faced before. And I wanna be able to extend that latitude. I wanna be your partner, you've been ours, and this is that opportunity for us to step up. This is our opportunity for us to collaborate with the parent community. But in doing so, we, there's those understandings, there's those expectations that we have to set that distance learning as a 100% option will not equate to the same level or quality of an experience if the entire district was facilitating a 100% distance learning program. The difference here, which I referenced earlier in the Q&A session, is that in a 100% distance model where an entire school or the entire district was closed, the teachers would be dedicated to supporting every child and interacting with every child that is home. But I have to be honest, in a model where our teachers have the responsibility and will be tending to the needs of children that'll be before them in the classroom, that the distance learning experience will be a bit more passive. Yes, teachers will engage with the children at home. There will be Google Meets, there will be the live streaming, but it's not gonna be the same level of experience as if it was 100% distance learning as a result of a closure or it's not gonna be the same type of experience that we would have in the hybrid model. If families were to opt for the 100% distance learning option, students would have to fulfill all school attendance requirements and participate in all learning experiences, not just as required by New York, uh, the Irvington schools, but as New York State as well. Students will be held accountable for all learning standards and will be assessed in the same manner as students that will be attending school in person through the hybrid model. Again, we must understand those limitations that are inherent in the experience in contrast to what I'll say I believe is a richer experience, a richer opportunity for in-person learning. We also need to know that 
we need to be able to plan. We need to be able to think about how we're going to manage our schools, how a teacher has the responsibilities to manage and plan his or her instruction from day to day and week to week. So this is not a decision to, to make lightly, and therefore we're not going to be able to extend families the latitude to think that one day I think this is a great idea for my child and I want him or her to participate in distance learning, and then a couple days later to think that, you know what, I think that I'm hearing good things about the hybrid model, or you know what, I want my child to be in school. When you make this decision, you're gonna to have to make a commitment for a period of time. And I'm gonna outline what that may look like. So this commitment to 100% distance learning will be throughout an entire marking period. So at the secondary level, that would be quarterly. And at the elementary level, it would be based upon our trimesters. When we think about this, we will outline what our change process will be and what that request would look like, but there's going to be a period of notica notification that you would have to provide us to be able to inform the planning. Parents will have to agree to all the different terms of the 100% distance learning option, acknowledging those points that I made before, acknowledging that there's going to be difference in the level of contact and the type of experience that your child will have learning throughout this model. That we're not gonna be able to create opportunities for students to attend in-person learning for four days a week. And let me clarify what I mean by that statement. If we have children and families, which we know we will, who opt their children into the 100% distance learning model that does not create open seats in our classrooms where there would be requests that would be honored that we would then invite other students to attend in-person learning four days a week. We have to remember why we have cohorts. The cohorts are to not only reduce the density, the daily attendance in our schools, but it's to serve us in contact tracing. It is to serve us in limiting exposure to the virus. So please don't reach out with those questions. Understand that we're not going to be able to honor them. We're also not going to honor any cohort changes. It's been something that unfortunately we've been very clear about and I understand that it's not easy for everybody, but please understand that we cannot accommodate 1800 different requests and operate the school district in a safe, effective manner. As was referenced related to pods, we cannot support those external efforts that parents initiate. Um, know that if you choose to go that, that route, it is certainly your prerogative. But we are dedicated to supporting and providing a high quality learning experience for all of our students, regardless of the mode of learning that they're engaged in. And I have all the trust and confidence in the world and our outstanding teachers that they're going to do this work and they're going to do it well. So tomorrow, we'll distribute a survey that must be completed by the end of the day Saturday. And I'll repeat that, it has to be completed by the end of the day Saturday. This, this survey is going to require a commitment from parents to enroll their children in 100% distance learning. Once you complete that survey, we will follow up with you next week, the week of the 17th. There will be a communication that will be authored by me that will come to you and you will need to complete your commitment to the 100% distance learning option. We will set a deadline and you'll need to be able to meet that deadline next week for your child to be enrolled in 100% distance learning. If you do meet both of those deadlines, one, completing the survey that'll go out tomorrow, and then completing the follow-up paperwork that'll go out next week, you will then receive school-specific communications confirming your enrollment in distance learning and any other important details that you need to know to prepare your child's start of the school year. Another area where we have received a lot of feedback and 
This was certainly evidenced in, through the comments in the beginning portion of this meeting. And it, it comes back to thinking about some of those guiding principles that I talked about in the beginning of our presentation tonight. We think about our students and think about those that have the greatest level of need. I identified cohort C earlier and students that are in special classes and we're gonna provide them with the opportunity for more in-person learning. But here I'm also thinking about our students that are the youngest, that are developing those foundational skills, the students that are learning to read, learning to write, learning their math skills, developing their critical thinking skills. We wanna to start to think about how we can provide opportunities for them. So when we think about the youngest students in our schools and wanting to have more opportunity for them to be in school for in-person learning, uh, we talked about it early on in our planning process. It wasn't something that was ignored in our work uh, with our curriculum and instruction planning committee back in June. But when we looked at it then, we had limitations in costs from transportation, concerns about social distancing, and routing needs that we couldn't manage at the time. We thought about in-school social distancing requirements, and we could not see a, a way around the challenges that were out there. We also recognized that we had limitations in staffing. If we were to bring all of our students in and try to have all of our students in K and 1 for a full day, we simply could not staff it. We simply could not provide for the necessary social distancing in our schools. So you may ask, how are some other districts doing it? Well, as Mr. Friedman mentioned earlier, every school district is different. Newer schools have bigger spaces. Older schools have smaller classrooms. Fewer classrooms can fit in them. When we think about some of the models that have been proposed in other school districts, they're looking at bringing in their primary age students four days a week. And in doing so, they're sacrificing the in-person learning experiences for their secondary students. While I believe and want to provide more in-person learning experiences for our youngest students, I am not willing to sacrifice the experiences of our secondary students. And when I think of those districts that have done that, they've utilized, in many cases, middle school, high school classroom space to be able to accommodate their youngest learners. And in doing so, they have placed those secondary students on 100% distance learning. I can't do that from an academic perspective, nor a social and emotional perspective. So what we're looking at now, in an area that we are still exploring, this is not a formal proposal or a plan that is an option that is being introduced to parents at this time. But this is what we are looking at doing right now. We're looking at our students in grades K and 1 only. These students would be able to participate in school on four half days for in-person learning, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday would continue to be a distance learning day. We would have two cohorts, just as we do today, an A and a B, but one group would att attend school in the AM session, the other would attend in the PM session. So you ask, how does this surface now, Chris? Why are we just talking about this in the middle of August? Well, things change. We hear different feedback. We look at things differently. We think outside the box. And we're trying to find a, a way that we can do this. Before we looked at this as a model of looking at all of our students K through three, could we do it all day? No. Could we do it half days? No, we couldn't manage it. Cost prohibitive, health safety concerns, instructional concerns. But now looking at it in smaller chunks, looking at it K-1, all of a sudden we see opportunity. We see this as being viable. We believe that looking at it through this lens, the smaller group of just K and 1, we can perform the necessary cleaning that has to occur with the transition of the cohorts throughout the school day. So when we think about dedicating additional custodial staff, we're going to have to bring them in force. They're going to have to come in on those four days 
and they're going to have to attack all those clean, all those classrooms, all those common spaces. And within a narrow period of time, we're going to go in and we're going to clean and sanitize those spaces. However, we simply don't have the capacity. We don't have the staff to be able to do that with a larger cohort of students. So when we think about this model going forward, there's other factors that go into this. So before we can make a final decision, we have to consider these important points. We have to think about operationally. We have to think about the cost factors associated with transportation. We have rough, rough estimates of what we believe it will take to do it. And we're prepared to make that commitment to deliver this model. But there's still some logistics to be confirmed. We need to confirm that we have that ability to do that cleaning that I talked about before. And again, these are both bullet points that I believe we can do. We have to understand that learning will be for a full school day. So if a student was to be in the cohort that attended the AM session of kindergarten or the AM session of first grade, when he or she gets home, there's going to be learning to occur. We have to make sure we hit those attendance standards that I referenced before. So there's work to be done. We have to think about what that looks like from a school side. But we also have to understand that there's going to be expectations that we'll have to set for you as a parent community. That they, it will be asynchronous learning that would occur because our teachers would be 100% engaged in supporting the students that would be present in school. So when we think about this, how do we move forward? Well, we're going to send out a survey tomorrow, folks. So there's a survey tomorrow. It's going to have two parts to it. One is going to be whether or not you want to opt your child into 100% distance learning. Two is going to be for K-1 parents. And we need your feedback as to whether you would be interested in your child participating in this model for half days a week, either a.m. or p.m. In thinking about this, I want to be clear, though, that this is not a third model or option that is being proposed. So based upon what I've spoken of this evening, hybrid is one. Distance learning is two. For K-1, this is not model three or option three. This would be an all-in move and commitment from this school district and the Board of Education that this is how we would deliver learning in grades K and 1. There would not be an opportunity, the capacity, to be able to facilitate the hybrid model if we went this route. So this is where parent feedback is going to be critical, and this is going to be important. So parents, when you receive this survey, and I need participation from every parent that have rising kindergartners and have rising first graders. I need every one of you to complete this. You need to think about what your child care needs are. You need to think about what your work schedules are. Because we're not going to be able to back in and out of these different experiences. So when we think about where we're going, we're also going to say that if we're able to implement this, that we are not going to be able to change cohorts. If your child is in cohort A and cohort A was assigned to the morning and the afternoons work better for you, we're not going to be able to flip back and forth. We have to think about that level of alignment that we're providing for families across the school district and the level of consistency that we have to provide to our decision making. You have to be reminded that the distance learning component of the experience will be asynchronous. Students will be required to attend to learning during the distance learning component, and attendance and participation will be monitored and required. We will provide you with all of the learning supplies and technology to support that distance learning piece. So you're not going to get a list and have to run off to Staples or Best Buy or Target to purchase things outside of the ordinary traditional school supplies. If there's some type of um, manipulative that will be needed to support a learning experience from home, we will provide that for you. We are going to provide lunches in schools. It's going to look 
and feel different than it did in the past. But as a part of this program, we are going to provide and have to provide lunch in our school. So there'll be a modified lunch period that will occur in school and students will be able to purchase lunch. Students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch will get their meals in school. So when we think about this, again, there's a survey that is going to go out. We need that level of participation that I referenced before. After we review that survey, again, the results of that survey, we'll, be, we'll start to analyze them this weekend. You'll have to complete the survey by end of day Saturday. If we have a critical mass in our community that is interested in this model, I will move this on for review at the Curriculum and Instruction Reopening Committee. That committee, which has parents, has teachers, has administrators, has Board of Education members on it, is going to be supplemented with additional representation from the Dow's Lane school community to ensure that we have all the minds and ideas at the table to make sure we explore every angle of this. The week of the 17th, the committee would meet. They would produce a written recommendation that would go to the reopening steering committee and the Board of Education. If the committee was to recommend advancing this model, the week of the 24th, there would be additional parent communication that would be sent with cohort assignments. Specifics of the experience would also be communicated to parents to help prepare your child for the start of the school year, and frankly, to help you prepare as well. And then we'll begin to develop our transportation schedules, and they would be distributed to the parents. If the committee does not see this as a viable option for any number of reasons, I'm gonna be transparent with you and I'm gonna tell you exactly what they are. We're gonna tell you why it didn't work. We're gonna tell you what we may be looking to do to overcome this. But to start the school year, we would certainly be in the original hybrid model that we proposed. So a few other tidbits that I want to provide and then open it up for board discussion. Um, some planning updates. Um, we talked about technology needs across the school district. I am committed to making sure that every student has a device in his or her hands to support learning from home. I also recognize there's a health and safety component to this. We cannot allow students, we do not want staff members to share devices during the school day because we simply cannot clean and sanitize them as we would need to. So during this period of time, every student is going to have access to a Chromebook. Every staff member is going to be provided with a Chromebook. We have ordered and they have been, um, all those devices are en route to the school. We have secured them. We have them on their way. We have ordered classroom cameras to support the live streaming, and they have been delivered. We have ordered classroom microphones. Unfortunately, at this time, there's a shortage of them everywhere. However, while we are still trying to source them, I would like to say that our IT people, Jay Strumwasser, Edutech, they were really smart. The camera that they identified has a microphone embedded in it. So we'll be able to utilize that to support the delivery of instruction through a streaming model. And then once the other microphones arrive, or if we're able to source them from a different vendor, we will be able to even increase the quality of the sound that will be delivered to our students at home. For health screening, and these again are protocols that we are going to spell out more clearly in the coming weeks. We'll introduce an app for daily health reporting and monitoring that'll be completed by parents and by staff members. That will have to be done on a daily basis. We are currently attempting to order and acquire all of the necessary PPE. Um, and that is looking at all different things from masks to shields, 
to barriers to gloves. And we are slowly acquiring all of these needs. And we are gonna be in a position where we, I believe we're gonna be absolutely prepared to open school. But I have to give credit to not only Ms. Stein, uh, think about Gary Knowles, the staff in the business office and their creative efforts. I wanna thank some folks in the community that have reached out and extended their access to supplies that we are taking advantage of that we as a school district could not acquire on the open market. So those of you out there who supported us and you know who you are, thank you. So how do we learn more about the reopening plan? As Mr. Friedman uh, referenced at the top of the meeting, there's gonna be two more public meetings that are coming up. The first is going to be this Thursday, 7 p.m. The second is next Thursday, 9 a.m. They will be facilitated by, via Zoom. I wanna clarify that those are not Board of Education meetings. Those are meetings that I am going to facilitate. Again, in, based upon the communication that I sent out earlier today, there is a Google form that is active for you to submit your questions in advance to help inform my planning. I will try to address as many of those questions as possible in my presentation. And then we certainly will leave time after my presentation for some Q&A. When we think about these meetings, they're gonna take on a little bit of a different shift. I'm gonna respond to those questions, try to answer the, those inquiries that you're making through the survey. But I also wanna talk a little bit more about the health and safety protocols. You know, this work is so exhausting. It is so detailed. There is so much to it. In the four meetings that we've had publicly on this topic, there's no way we could have addressed every one of these topics. So there's information that I have not talked about in detail that I'll talk about in those pre, uh, meetings. And then there's going to be supplemental resources that are gonna be posted on our reopening Irvington website um, for you to review. But I'm specifically gonna to touch on health and safety, health screening, screenings, transportation, food services, and building cleaning and sanitation. Um, so how do you get your questions answered? Again, go to that website. We have a FAQ that's there that we're updating on a regular basis. I wanna give a, certainly um, a shout out to, to Mary Ellis, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, who is working on that and updating that for you um, to answer your questions. Know that a lot of the questions that surface on a regular basis, if we see reoccurring themes, we're gonna address that. We're gonna add that to the FAQ. You can email questions that will go to reopening at irvingtonschools.org. Know that the, that email directly points to my inbox, Ms. Stein's inbox, and Ms. Ellis's inbox. You can still ask your questions that go to the Board of Education. Email them at board at Irvington Schools. That email address goes to them and to me, and we will respond as quickly as we possibly can. Um, go and check out that website on a regular basis. When I have my Facebook live sessions, which are typically on a Wednesday, uh, a Wednesday at noon, come and join me for some real-time updates. Um, there are gonna be school level meetings. I know our elementary school principals have already begun those meetings. Our secondary schools are going to begin to announce their meetings. They're gonna be school level meetings where you can ask those questions that are gonna be specific to that level and those that may not be appropriate or may get a little too into the weeds for these broader district level meetings. Um, continue to review school level communications. Know that they're gonna come out for me on a regular basis. Know that I archive all of them on the website in a couple different places, but those related to school reopening, go to the website, there's an archive tab there. And that school um, schedules will be communicated over the course of the coming weeks. Other than that, um, this is who we are as a school community. This is what I'm about as your superintendent and that we think of that health and safety of every student and every staff member every day. This is an imperfect world that we live in. This has been an imperfect process, but I think we've done good work. We've done good work because we've been deliberate. We've been focused on those guiding principles. We've been flexible. And we've listened, and I appreciate your feedback. And the feedback that you have provided, as you can see from tonight, has expanded our thinking, has forced us to be a little more innovative, think outside the box, 
and is in resulting in some certain shifts in our plans and some potential shifts. So I appreciate your feedback and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I know the amount of work that you and the rest of the administrators have put into this. Uh, thank you for the continued flexibility. You know, as we've said throughout this process, it's going to be an evolving process. It's going to change over time. And uh, you know, we appreciate the continued uh, re-looking at items. And you know, I know from the uh, times that uh, we get your communications, just the amount of time that you're engaged in, in this work, and, and again, uh, you know, thank you to you and everyone else for the, the efforts. Uh, one thing that uh, you mentioned a couple of times during your presentation, which uh, those uh, who aren't deeply steeped in uh, education speak may not have picked up on is you used the word seat time several times. And if you could just explain a little bit what you mean by that and how that impacts the planning that has gone on. Yeah, so simply stated, we have to look at attendance requirements in a, in a real complex way, and it, it gets down more nuts and bolts, specifically looking at um, the secondary level. But kids need to be in school a certain amount of time. They need to participate in certain areas of study, certain uh, number of hours, to be able to earn credits to move forward to advance through their school experience. So thinking very broadly, attendance is a requirement for school, not just to make sure that you're present, to make sure that you're well, but to make sure that you are accessing the curriculum and that you're meeting the standards that are set forth by the Arvington schools and those that are set forth by New York State. Thank you. And then uh, just a question in, in terms of the surveys that will be going out, uh, is there also a need to survey for people's thoughts towards transportation this time in terms of whether they'll so they still want to proceed with transportation or make alternate arrangements? And if so, will that be part of the surveys that are going to be done? Um, so good question. And yes, um, we very deliberately separated them because I didn't want to muddy the waters with the thinking. We need the survey data related to transportation separate and aside from the district, 100% dist distance learning option. And for the concept that we're exploring for K and one, that uh, letter went out today and get to asking you to have your eyes open, looking for a communication that's coming forth. And I know from communications that I've received from parents who are eligible for transportation that they are receiving that survey. That survey is coming from the Ardsley Transportation Department because as a reminder that um, we are in a cooperative shared service with the Quad Villages and Ardsley is the lead agency in that. Um, so they actually have staff that they directly employ um, that runs the operation. So their leadership is actually sending that survey to all families. If you do not receive that survey, check your spam folder, to your junk, just make sure that it's not there. And then please reach out to, to Carol or me, use that reopening uh, email address, and we'll make sure that you get that access to that survey. We need your feedback because that um, will help us plan all of our routing and help us ensure that we have as much social distancing as possible on our school buses. Thank you, and then also uh, just a point of, I guess, clarification in terms of the now uh, distance learning option that parents will have to voluntarily place their children into. The survey is going out. If you select yes for that survey, but then in the follow-up conversations the next week in terms of learning about what the requirements are around it and what the expectations are, will you then be able to opt out? Or once you say yes in the survey, is that done and you're, you must go forward? Good question, Brian. It is a two-step process. Step one, you respond yes that you want to do it in the survey that will be launched tomorrow. Then next week, you will receive a communication from me that will have you agreeing to the terms or the conditions, expectations of the experience. Once you um, sign off and return that, and that again will be a Google form. Once you complete that, that'll be the verification. So you will have through likely um, the middle to the end of next week, 
um, to be able to finalize that decision. Thank you. Uh, just a, a note as I start to see things pop up in the Q&A again, as our protocol is, I will open up the community comment period again after the presentation is concluded. And at that point, I'll ask you for your names and addresses. So please uh, don't try to post now because I we, we're not checking it. And uh, I will acknowledge people based on once we open the process. So, so please hold off putting your names in there until I again open the community comment uh, portion of the agenda. And if I just may add, there's a lot of good questions that are going to be asked, and we can't give all the details tonight. It's not reasonable or fair to everybody to think that, you, that we'd be able to do that. Um, but know that like pickup drop off is going to look and feel different. There's going to be assigned times for parents that are driving their children and for walkers to arrive. We may break that into a series of different groups. The buses are going to return arrive and depart at a time when we're not going to let parents on campus because we don't want traffic and two, two we certainly don't want to have any congestion where we're going to have social distancing concerns. Um, we will be able to communicate what those specific hours look like, um, but we should be looking at approximately a two and a half hour in person school day that will then provide for transportation gap in between because the same buses are going to be taking students home and bringing the next cohort to school. Thank you. So at this time, I'll uh, look to the rest of the board for their questions. Uh, Dave? Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank you, Ms. Stein, and for Ms. Ellis, who's working at home, and for all of the teachers, not only in Irvington, but everywhere in the country. Thank you. And uh, I'm, you know, thinking about you on a daily basis as much as I'm thinking about my own kids and family. So thank you all. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, you mentioned all the things that I was going to mention. Brian, you even asked one of my questions. So I'm going to skip that one about. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a little bit of the nitty gritty and talking about like sort of how if kids are kids who are watching through this uh, this very innovative methodology that you're you know we're going to give a shot. How are those kids who are watching going to be able to ask? So I, I'm trying to put together a bunch of the things here, right? Like people who might want to, whatever this pod thing is, or uh, group kids together to work when they're not in school, but out of school and watching things. And the kids are going to come up with questions. And, 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 and I think that's one of the motivators. Like, how, how is my kid going to ask questions? So how are the school, individual schools in different ways going to handle being able on the Thursday and Friday or the Monday and the Tuesday to field important instructional questions from kids. Um, that's one question. Another question, at some point I would love. Dave, if, do you want, to, you want to pause and let uh, oh, Dr. Harrison to, yeah, answer sure. that as opposed to just. Uh, okay, sure, either way. So, you know, I, I, mean, I spent a lot of talking tonight and I'd love to keep talking, but I want us to model the work that we're doing. And while um, Ms. Ellis is not sitting here in the room with us tonight, she's engaged just a student to be engaged in a global meet. So I would like to invite Ms. Ellis to jump Sweet. in as our leader of curriculum instruction to respond to that question. So Mary. Okay, so David, thank you very much for the question. Can you hear me okay? Yep, all good. Okay, great, thank you. So there's a variety of ways in which uh, students will be able to ask questions. It's one of the things that we're gonna be talking about when the teachers are back in school about what kind of systems can we set up? What, what kind of common agreements can we make about how to approach things like this so that students know exactly what to do? And I've been doing a lot of exploring about different ways to do this um, through a variety of, uh, you know, looking with colleagues, reading, I'm, you know, immersed in this right now. And there's a lot of discussion about using the chat feature in uh, Google Meet for them to put questions in, for there to be certain hand signals where a student might indicate, I have a question. Uh, so the kids who are at home will be on a Google Meet and they will have an opportunity to interact with the teacher and potentially with other classmates through that platform. So that would that's what can happen during the class time while the teacher and half of the students are physically in the classroom and the other half of the students are learning at home. Uh, the teachers also, I mean, our teachers are amazing for being available to students, to family, to answer questions. And I think they've um, 
just really gone above and beyond when we were in a full distance model to make sure that people had the support that they needed. We know that we need to set up very specific times and protocols for both students and parents to access teachers so that they can get the information they need. We also want to be sure that our teachers are able to find an appropriate work-life balance and um, that they're not doing parent emails at 1130 at night like I know they were doing all spring. So we're going to be working together to try to find out what system can we build to ensure that there's access. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Dave, if I can just uh, also add something to that. Uh, I, I know we've had discussion at the board level about obviously the work that the teachers need to engage in to prepare to embark in this new model. And there's obviously time that's been set aside before school starts, but also time during school. But I also think uh, like anyone who's done something new, uh, you're only gonna get better at it if you do it and make some mistakes and figure out the model that works best. So I, I think we need everyone to recognize that how something is working on day one may not be the same as how it's going to work on day 15 or day 30 or day 60. I think we all need to just be reflective of, of the concept that this is a brand new system for not just the students, the parents, but also for the teachers. And as they continue to work in it, I know our wonderful teachers will work on their craft and look to try to improve on the experience however they can. Dave, back to you for whatever. Uh, no, that was a great, um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, and that was a great segue into sort of, um, or maybe it wasn't, but I thought it was for a moment. Uh, the next question I have uh, is, so in the, in the emergency, you know, remote instruction that we engaged in in the spring, you know, sort of in the response to the pandemic initially, um, there were a lot of noticings that I as a parent made, also as an educator, uh, about the organization of online learning uh, for kids, especially even even kids heading into sixth grade and seventh grade and so forth. Um, and I know that we're focusing on the social emotional work. Um, can we look to the beginning month of school to help kids outside of just parents helping kids in the traditional manner that parents help kids by helping them get, you know, uh, planners and things like that, but sort of teachers working with kids to understand the pop up windows and you know, when I, uh, when I click on the assignment, it opens three more windows and I don't know where those windows lead. And then I have to click on the assignment to submit the assignment. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I imagine that, you know, part of social emotional piece is life skills and the idea of self-management and uh, organization. So, uh, you know, will self-management be a key component in the beginning weeks and months? David, I would say absolutely. And part of the reason for having those first few days of school be full distance learning is an opportunity for teachers to go through with students exactly how to use the various online tools that they'll be using to get to uh, know the kids, start to set up that, that safe and welcoming classroom environment. So we're really looking for that to be the time when the teachers give the kids the tools that they will need in order to be effective. Um, thank you again. Uh, last couple points. Uh, one, um, I, I was interested in the attendance component you were talking about, especially with all the chatter about pods and things like that, and just sort of helping the community members who have been reaching out to me and, and, and across, you know, of course, uh, you know, to all of us about, you know, what do I do? Where do I, do I put my kid in a pod? I don't want my kid being alone. I don't want this. And then I think about how the attendance piece is. And I just want to make sure that people understand, that parents understand, my kids need to go to school. And right, and based on what you were saying earlier, and that, you know, there's a lot of things that can compromise attendance. And, and also, uh, you know, I, I get one of the things that I thought about was in some of these pods, folks, uh, you know, there's, there's, I don't know how many certified teachers are out there to lead pods. Um, so that's something also to think about, right, in terms of an education. Um, so attendance is key. Can't learn if you're not there, uh, whether it's virtual or not. Um, the next piece is mask breaks. Um, it's very difficult to sit here for what we've been here for two hours with the mask on. Uh, someone even made a comment in the thing about don't touch your masks. I apologize. 
uh, it's very difficult. So I, you know, the mass breaks is going to be key. Um, you know, and it gets it's hot. It's real, real hot. And fans and AC is a tricky situation now. So just we'll talk a little bit about mass breaks. Yeah. So um, we're going to have more specific information that'll come out about it next week. Um, but what we're talking about here in Irvington is that it is going to be six feet and masks. Recognizing that there's going to be times where it's inevitable. A teacher is going to come closer to a student to talk. They're going to, people are going to pass each other. Children are going to pass each other. But we want masks on throughout the school day. We want um, to keep our proper social distancing at all times. But during the course of the day, we have to eat. We're not going to be able to eat through the mask. We're going to have to get, take drinks. We're going to not be able to do it through the mask. So when um, those needs uh, arrive, arise or those times surface, um, we're going to ensure that students are socially distanced, that everybody's going to be facing a single direction. Just like us in this room t tonight, we're all at least six feet apart. No one's looking directly at each other in close proximity. You could take your mask off. We're modeling tonight, like realistically, like we could be taking breaks throughout this. I've been taking some drinks along the way. We're going to have to do it. We've been sitting here, Dave, you spoke of like, like literally our endurance in adjusting to this, um, <laughs> that um, during the course of this meeting, we would, would have already had mass breaks, that teachers would have facilitated when students were seated in their classrooms, socially distancing and say, guys, here's 10 minutes. You're going to take your masks off. Everybody's going to be focused the same direction. We're not going to be breathing, coughing, sneezing, whatever on each other. Um, that we're going to need breaks from this and and we're going to provide them structured throughout the school day teachers will facilitate that in their classrooms students our, our teachers are going to receive instruction on that during our opening days of the school year and um, our students will receive instruction as we transition them in to those first days of school in that phased in model that we outlined earlier awesome thanks and then the last question more of a suggestion or thought um you know a bunch of years back, we, as a district, invested and developed in an online curriculum tool called Atlas. Uh, Ms. Kaur, Dr. Core gave us a presentation on that, provided the public with a link. Might be a good time to resurface that link with people being at home. Um, I would also suggest, uh, you had mentioned you talked about the standards of learning and so on. It might be nice to put the New York State learning standards up in a real easy place for parents to, who are trying to help along with their children, um, letting them know that the Engage New York math modules are online. Um, and that they also can, um, I, I don't know if, if it's possible for parents to get a login alongside their kid to a lot of these Excel maths and things like that. But just knowing that there are, you know, I know obviously there are lots of parents who cannot be side by side with their children, understanding, but having those resources digitally, at least when they get home from work, they can help homework wise or whatever, just resources for parents to help along. Yeah, uh, I think so, David, the curriculum mapping and the um, learning standards, there are links to both of those off the curriculum and instruction page on our website. Yeah, and I would say, Mary, that we may want to choose to add them to um, an FAQ. The re yeah. New addition to the FAQ. Yep. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the work again. Thank you, uh, Beth. <laughs> Beth, is your mic on? Let me get it. Really, yeah, turn to see you have a green light and then really project. Just bear with us, folks. Beth, bring the microphone even I think, closer to you. Like, there you, go. there you go. It's muted. Yeah, you're still on red, so there you go. Okay, I'm sorry for that delay. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, it's great to see the flexibility of tonight's presentation in response to a lot of input from trustees and from the community, and I thank everyone for that. I mean, it's very hard, as people are saying, to build the airplane while you're flying. That's the metaphor everybody's been using. Um, but I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, some of them involve ventilation so i'm assuming those should wait for our next meeting that would be correct okay involving airflow and fresh air exchange the others have to do with supplies for the distance learning portion of hybrid so i know that we touched upon briefly the fact that um, 
when you raise the possibility of a different kindergarten model that you'll be providing supplies for the kids to use at home for asynchronous learning. But is there a plan for the synchronous remote learning part when, when the kids, like, what, let's say when the BBs are home? So if I understand, it really a two-part question. I definitely will speak about ventilation next week, and it's a, a really complicated topic. Um, but I, w I do sense it's out there and it's on people's minds. I do want to speak to it. Um, and um, when we think about where we are um, right now, um, we're working through all the details. Um, all of our classrooms have uh, mechanical, me mechanical ventilation systems that provide the require air exchanges mm -hmm. by all standards that we comply with in the schools. Um, we are programming these devices so the air dampers are set at 100% as long as we can. So it's going to be bringing in fresh air from the outside as they are circulating the air as required. Um, you know, certainly as weather turns colder, we have to kind of adjust that a little bit or else we're not going to be able to heat the spaces adequately. Um, but we're going to work through and get the necessary guidance as we do that. Um, when we think of our air handling systems, um, whether we're in a space where there's central air conditioning, um, we're proud to say, and we should go back to think about commitments we made as a board and administration two years ago, that we're ahead of schedule. Every classroom is going to have a window air conditioner unit. Those window air conditioning units all have settings on it that will circulate just air or fan. We can pop windows open a little bit. There are requirements um, that have been eased in and around school emergency planning that we can have classroom doors open for natural circulation. So based upon the classroom, um, the local principal, teacher, custodial staff will make the necessary adjustments there. We've also ordered and will provide, um, install MERV 13 uh, filters in every air handler, which is what is recommended for use in wherever you can acquire them. And Mr. Knowles has done a great job in, in sourcing all of them. Um, so as far as that goes, we're in good shape. We're on track to be able to meet all the, the expectations. And um, when we think about the challenges around uh, the whole concept of, of, of ventilation, it's a whole evolving aspect of this right now. So it's like literally something that we're going to be adjusting and dealing with as we move through this process. And we're going to implement all recommendations and best practices wherever we possibly can. Um, with respect to... Um, the different su um, supplies and supporting children in the different scenarios. Um, when we think about um, students that are home during the, the distance learning component of the hybrid, we literally are thinking that there are, there's gonna be like care packages, that when a child comes into school for Monday and Tuesday, when they go home at the end of the day, Tuesday, they may have like a big Ziploc bag and in that Ziploc bag are going to be the instructional learning supplies that they're going to need for Thursday and Friday. And we'd flip that scenario, right? You're in Thursday and Friday. You're going to go home with that bag of supplies that you'll need for Monday and Tuesday. Very clearly, you know, we're going to give everything clean and ready to go home. And then we ask families to make sure you return them and make sure that they're, they're clean and sanitized as well. Um, similarly, I referenced, um, you know, Chromebooks and other devices and um, that we, when we think about that, we're going to provide them for everybody. Um, please don't start to reach out and say, how do I get it now? Those details are all going to be forthcoming in communications from the school. We want to provide everyone with a Chromebook. We literally have Chromebooks sitting in boxes that we haven't had the opportunity to unpack yet. They all have to be set up and ready to work on the Irvington domain and have them preloaded with all the Irvington account information. Um, you will get communication from your school that, be, that will, one, ask if you want the device, so you're opting in or opting out of device, and two, you'll get then instructions on how you will acquire that device. So all that information will be forthcoming. Well, that's great because that also responds to a question we had had from another uh, community member, um, I think, at our last meeting about the potential to use your own devices. Um, yeah, so I, I would say from a, a, a practical sense, it would be frankly easier for us as a school district if everybody used the Chromebooks we provided because mm -hmm. it simply streams on, streamlines the teaching and learning experience. The teachers understand the platform by which students are going to be interacting with what they're doing. Um, it also enables the district to provide a level of support 
for students and their parents that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do well or efficiently mm -hmm. if everybody was working on different devices. So Chromebook, you know, in my house, I have a high schooler. Um, I personally use a MacBook. I have one here for work and you go to my desk at home, I have a dark gray MacBook sitting there that I use for personal business. But my son, while he's involved in distance learning, he uses the Chromebook and he wants to use the MacBook, but I tell him to use the Chromebook because I'm thinking of his teacher. Um, but if you're set on using your Mac, set on using your, your PC and that's your own device, you can do so from home. Um, it just know that there's limitations in, in the support and we may not be able to help you as readily as we could. We have a student help desk where you can submit requests for tech support. Um, we know that's going to skyrocket um, in the beginning of the year, and hopefully we'll settle in like we did in the spring. Um, but we're not going to be able to support everybody as easily if you're using different devices. When we think about student experiences in school, we're going to want kids to bring them back and forth with them, right? So if you're bringing them back and forth, they're going to be in a durable case um, that has a, a label on it for the student, has branded with the Irvington logo. Um, so it's going to be durable, you're going to bring it back and forth, but we need kids to bring it back and forth because we want you to have it to use in school. So you're not sharing a device with anyone else. Mm -hmm. What you can't do, especially at the elementary levels, you're not going to be able to bring your device in and use it in school because it's not going to be set up to work on our, our network. It's not going to be set up to, to, uh, have all the applications downloaded on it. So realistically, my strongest recommendation, use the Chromebook. It's your tax dollars at work and it will ease the process for students. It may not be as fancy as your MacBook or your Lenovo, but um, it'll get the job done and that's what our teachers are planning um, for in, in all of their instruction. Thank you, that's um, also very helpful to know. I did wanna build on something that Mr. Graber said about um, parent access, perhaps, for example, well, I'm sorry, the mask makes it really hard. Um, if uh, the superintendent wants to repeat what I ask, that's fine. So in terms of what Mr. Graber was saying about parent access to supports like Engage New York, right? There's another aspect um, for secondary school students, which has to do with Google Classroom and the provision only of passwords to the students. And during this time of hybrid learning, I'm wondering, there is um, a, a piece of Google Classroom that allows parents to receive alerts without having their own password so that they know about pending assignments or tests that are coming up, anything like that. Um, I will get you the name of it. I hadn't come with it tonight because it was Mr. Graber's question that had led me to think about it. It's something like Google family or Google support. And it's something that pushes out separately so that parents are aware of the uh, responsibilities coming up for their kids. So I'm hoping that the district can look at that in a little more detail in light of the amount of home yeah. engagement that's going to increase. So that's something that could be a consideration, but that is not a, um, a service that a school can provide that is mm -hmm. school dependent. It is actually like a parent facing tool, as I understand it, that the parent would set it up on their end and then have to connect with the teacher to link what's happening with the Google Classroom. It's not a functionality of the classroom suite that a school has. So that's something that's not immediately available. But I see. something that I know um, Jay, our director of technology, is looking at. Um, as I referenced earlier, um, Google Meet has a, um, a whole slew of new applications um, or enhancements that are coming out because everybody's trying to compete with Zoom and everybody's trying to one-up one another. So there's like all the features that we know in Zoom, those are going to be, you know, popping up now in, in Google Meet within the next week. Um, there's other features like that. So we're working our way through each and every one of them. Google's literally just launching and having announcements like this week about all these new features that are coming out. Um, so, so we're working through them because we know that is going to be a foundation of what we're doing. We need to um, make them available to our teachers, train our teachers on it. Other tools like that as, you know, available, we certainly will look to support them where viable. 
Right, and I, I guess as you said, with more school-based presentations available for parents and families and guardians to learn more about the details, we'll learn more as those go forward. So thank you. I don't know who speaks after me. So uh, Jane, uh, go ahead, please. You have to just hold the button where it says push, and for a second, it should light up green. You want me to ask my question? Yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Harris. Thank you. Thank you and your staff for all the hard work you've done uh, putting this together, this presentation. One, I have two questions. One is when the students join in um, after the marking period, the um, distant learning students, you said they could go hybrid after a marking period. How will they transition into a classroom that's already been meeting and they already um, know the protocols and the procedures for distance learning and mask breaks and they know each other? Um, I was just curious about, has there been any thought about how these um, students are gonna transition back in? I think it's a good question, Jane. And then just so everyone does hear, um, if a family elected to have their child in 100% distance learning and then changed their mind and at one of the ends of a grading period elected to have their child to then transition into a hybrid model, how would we support that transition because a child hasn't been in that structure um, previously? Um, the one thing that I would say is that they're gonna witness and observe a lot of that based upon the streaming and the other engagement that's gonna happen with the class in the distance learning experience. Um, but I think you pose a really good question. And when we think about those transitions, there's gonna be a need, just as David asked the question and Mary spoke to student and parent support in navigating things, there's gonna to have to be protocols and that, that we establish and put together. Um, uh, some of the work that we're doing and Mary's gonna be working with a number of our colleagues and planning like the uh, professional learning sessions and all the protocols that are being developed that are gonna be rolled out district wide. So like, well, the one thing that immediately comes to mind is we could create an instructional video, right? And that when a student transition to school, we can provide that level of support just as someone moves from one school community to another, there's new routines, right? So um, we could you know, preempt some of that, that, that anxiety or the, the bumps that could come from that transition with communications such as those could be in writing, those that could occur through a Google Meet um, those that could be in a video, then supplemented and supported by some in-person experiences upon their, their entry. Thank you, and I have another question. Um, the governor said that the districts will be responsible for the testing. Can you speak a little bit about that? Has <laughs> you know what, I think our governor has done one heck of a job <laughs> in man managing like the greatest crisis of our lives. But I gotta tell you, we don't have the legal authority to do so. We do not have the ability as a school system to administer and supervise testing. So quite frankly, um, last Friday was my first day off of the summer, but I can tell you I was standing there watching this and disappointed to hear the governor phoning it in as opposed to seeing uh, his smile on, on the television. Um, but I can tell you that we do not administer testing in our schools. This week, I will publish our processes on the website that are being directed by the Westchester Department of Health. Every Monday morning, a group of superintendents, including myself, meet with George Latimer and the Westchester County Department of Health. They are outlining the processes and protocols by which one, testing would occur and how it would occur. And I'll tell you that we're not testing in school. If a student is displaying symptoms, <coughs> staff member displaying symptoms, they're gonna be isolated in our school in an isolation space, and then they're gonna go home. They're gonna be directed to contact their doctor and report for testing. They're gonna be directed to um, a proper testing uh, site and location um, that will be identified either by their physician or by the Department of Health and they will undergo 14 days of quarantine until such time that they are cleared to return 
if they have not been exposed to someone with symptoms, they're not, uh, that is pos tested positive, or if they don't test, po or if they test positive themselves. So we're not doing that. Then when we think about um, the contact tracing, each of our schools, we've identified point people. So as a district, I'm the district level contact tracing point person. The Department of Health knows that. They, they send communications to me. It's pretty logical to think who the point people in our schools are gonna be. It's gonna be our school nurse and your school principal. So if we do have a confirmed positive case in our school, we are gonna receive that communication from the Department of Health. And then from there, we are going to support them in the contact tracing process using the state resources through the Department of Health. We will give them the names of all the contacts, the contact information, they will facilitate that process based upon the experiences that we have. The, uh, if there's a, a case, a suspected case, we will quarantine and follow directions as outlined by the Department of Health in, in um, consultation with our wonderful school physician, Catherine Huff. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. Thank you. So I, I guess to quote Warner Wolf, we'll now go to the videotape. And uh, uh, Michael, if uh, uh, you're able to now, is it time for your questions? OK. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone in, in our school district uh, and the community. I know the PTSA and IEF uh, it's, are also working alongside to support the work. Uh, but, Thank you to, to our administrators and teachers who are able to participate in, in this work over the summer. Um, just want to share a quick uh, story related to the, the conversation between uh, Beth and Chris that I was just talking to a teacher friend in another state where school has started. Uh, and she's working with third graders and basically you know, the initial days are all about tech support for third graders. Um, so it's, it's uh, I, I hear uh, Chris, when he says how challenging it will be for uh, our schools to work with uh, and our faculty work with students. Um, and, and that also raised a question, Chris, do we, for these hundreds of Chromebooks and new cameras and new protocols, is our district still have three people that deal with all of that? Painfully, yes. Okay, so every time we hear all this work going on, there, there are three people that are somehow managing uh in, in, in that process uh, it's uh that's that's i think the reminder uh, that we'll hear many different areas of sort of the capacity challenges we have with with uh implementing this work um i just wanted to dig in for a second uh, and i think this is one that i see us circling back to uh in future meetings as well of, of differentiating between uh, what i think are two different terms that we have to clarify uh, with maybe different terms. Uh, I'm calling it hybrid remote learning and 100% distance learning. I don't know, you know, we can come to a, a settled terms uh, that maybe you can provide, Chris, but um, you know, what, what's become clear to me and was a challenge was, was starting, and I'm only starting to, under, to, to understand are the differences between what we're talking about when uh, students learn remotely as part of hybrid learning and uh, what the district imagines, uh, you know, this the new and improved uh, distance learning, 100% distance learning would look like if the whole district uh, were involved. I was wondering, you, you did go into it in the presentation, um, but um, you know, when I look at it, the schedules for both remote learning and 100% distance learning, the hybrid learning and the 100% distance learning seem to be the same. Um, I think the main difference is in terms of the teacher's attention in a hybrid, they're split between in class and at home. Um, but I guess when you were talking about the presentation, uh, I know this is a recent pivot to, to now considering offering 100% distance learning alongside um, the, the, the students who are doing in class. So I guess they're not really doing 100% distance learning, they are doing full-time hybrid remote learning uh, if we're starting to, to, to differentiate. Um, and so even in that model, I, I don't believe that you're saying it's a, there's terms that are confusing to me. Like you, when you say live streaming, as someone who works 
in media, live streaming is a, is a passive uh, received video and not interactive, but we're actually, if I understand correctly, using uh, in this framework uh, that we're calling live stream, Google Hangout. So that's an interactive, uh, that has the, interact the ability to interact uh, that live streaming, which is a one way does not have, is that correct? Like we're actually using Google Hangout in that hybrid remote learning framework. So we're going to be looking to find a multitude of ways in which the students at home can remain engaged. It might be through that. It might be that they're logged on to a Google Doc and contributing to a conversation that way. Uh, we're going to be looking for every way that we can for them to, to not be passive, but to be active in the learning, even if they are not in the classroom. Great. So, so I, that's, that's something that's thrown me before, but I, I I've heard a few comments from principals as well, and I look forward to those school-based meetings where we, we learn that it is not a it's strictly passive. We're, we're staring Absolutely. at our laptops uh, the whole school day. It's, it's meant to, just like in, in typical schooling, uh, in-school learning, teachers are, are changing up their, their uh, modality uh, you know, every period of time just to, to you know, learn differently and instruct differently to, to keep engagement high. So that's great to hear. Um, so you might find yeah. mid-lesson that a teacher asks a question of the class and everyone is responsible for typing it into a Google Doc. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think we'll, that's what we'll learn as we go forward, particularly once our teachers are back, uh, we'll be able to see more and more concretely all those uh, different techniques uh, that our master teachers uh, employ. So, um, but it's, it's a work in progress. Um, the other question I have is that, uh, you know, I, I hear one, sometimes one thing or read one thing and, and they sometimes conflict. So uh, I, I see in your development of the K-1 uh, process that you want to take into account uh, what the home structure is and what their uh, families are able to support. Um, and so I, I, one concern I have is with um, you know, it's very different for students to arrive at school because we create a structure for them and support and, and uh, schedule, but that's not necessarily true when we reverse it and put school into people's homes. Uh, there are, I'm sure, many families that can support uh, this learning. They have, you know, a, a home with adequate space and, and perhaps a parent or other uh, person who's able to, to support that person. But we hear uh, if we're talking about consistent themes from, you know, two working parents or a, a working parent or a uh, family with uh, siblings where the older sibling will have to care for the younger sibling. So I'm very concerned about the idea that, um, that you know, when we talk about equity, that, that those students or those families uh, may not have that equity, may not have uh, that accommodation to, to you know, be able to follow the, the bell schedule uh, and do the synchronous learning. Um, I, I, I hope that we can inquire if we're doing a survey. I don't know if you can update the survey for tomorrow. I'd be wondering, I'm wondering how many families can actually support a bell schedule at home uh, based on, on what their means are and what their family structure is. I'm just curious to, you know, I, I have to imagine. I think Mr. Hanna froze. That's frozen, yeah. So I don't know, Ms. Ellis, if you had any couple comments, you could. Sure, share. sure. So my, Michael, I, I hope you can hear me even though you're frozen on our side. Um, we share your concern and uh, have listened very, very closely to the feedback we've gotten from parents. Um, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from kindergarten and first grade parents about how challenging the spring was for their students. And that's why we want to do everything possible to ensure that those students find their way into the building face to face with the teacher every day. And we feel that we can accomplish a lot with those students in a short period of time. Not as much as if they were there all day, but we can accomplish a lot. Um, for the older children, especially the second and third graders at Dow's Lane, we definitely recognize it's a challenge. And our teachers are, as they always have, are going to take into consideration who are the students in front of them, what's their developmental, what are their developmental needs, and try to design instruction that will work appropriately for them. 
for a for a second or third grader, it may be beginning a lesson on screen where there, there's some direct instruction and then kids are sent off to do independent work away from the screen so that they're not sitting on it the whole time. And they come back later to share out what they've done and discuss. So just like instruction, as you mentioned before, looks very different in a classroom and teachers change it up all the time, we're looking for the exact same thing to happen in an online environment. And it's one of the reasons, as Chris said, that our teachers need time. They need time to collaborate, to plan, because this is a big shift. Thanks. Uh, that, that's great. I only caught the end because uh, as <laughs> yeah, will be the case, uh, I, I, uh, my camera dropped out of this Zoom meeting for a moment. Um, so I caught the end. But I, I think that, that that last part that I did catch is important that I think we all need to, to know that what uh, this looks like uh, at the beginning of September will probably be very different based on what our teachers will bring to the process and, and, and inform the process as well as our families, uh, that it'll look very different by the end of the month. Um, and as we, as we learn by watching how the kids do and seeing how things go and adjusting, you know, it's a, it's a dance that happens between a teacher and the class where you're constantly responding. Yes. Um, so, I'll have to go back and look at the video for the, the, the majority of your response, uh, but I'll presume it was excellent. Um, the word equity comes up over and over again in this presentation, and that leads me to, to ask uh, Dr. Harrison if, um, you know, at the beginning of the summer, uh, we did some important work and conversations uh, that, that began in our community around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, it's so critical as these conversations continue that it be a centerpiece of, of our planning uh, where, where do we stand with uh, that work uh, more explicitly in terms of working with, uh, I guess there was NYU uh, and, and that work? Because I feel like time is running out as the summer progresses to, to get that, that work rolling. Uh, and, and I hope that it's still a front and center for, for our district as we enter this year. Michael, uh Time is running out on sum summer in general, and that we certainly have a need and obligation to do a lot of critical uh, tasks. Um, the, our work and initiative associated with diversity and equity is not lost on me, and it's one that I have very publicly committed to on numerous occasions, and I recall very specifically highlighting that it would be integrated within this work throughout the course of this meeting um, at the last Board of Education meeting, um, we are finalizing plans and making adjustments, just as we're adjusting to the realities of our, our circumstances and modifying our reopening plans. We're modifying and adjusting our plans with NYU. That commitment is gonna be front and center. It's gonna be a part of the work that we start the school year with. Um, we're gonna have professional development on the opening staff day with NYU and our staff, there's gonna be ongoing professional development throughout the course of the school year. And there will be, um, there will be the necessary work um, associated with all of um, the, the root cause analysis and other supplemental work that we're gonna partner with. Um, it is not lost on me. Um, I, I have to be really honest. I've, I've owned this commitment it is something that to my core I am committed to. It is work that we are going to get done, um, but there frankly are not enough minutes in the day to advance everything as quickly as we would like to. I am in communication, I've traded emails today with the staff at NYU. We're looking to finalize that plan. Um, we're gonna get there. I will, before summer's out, we'll have that plan in place and I'd fully suspect that before the end of the summer, the board will be approving the, the contract to partner with them and our friends at the PTSA and IEF will be getting grant applications from me uh, to support those efforts as well. Um, I'm just not able to speak to it today, um, but um, it is continuing to be in the works. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, that, that ongoing commitment that, that you've made. And I think, you know, I just shared that question because I hear uh, right, the capacity issues of, of, do, of working on reopening, but as I think all of us, I hope, uh, who are listening at home and, and in the, the meeting that, uh, you know, equity is such a critical aspect of this work. 
uh, and that uh, it's not something that we de-link because we're too busy. It's actually something that we need to double down on, uh, on focusing as, as part of our reopening plan. So I appreciate that, uh, what you share. Uh, the, the final question is just as a, BEO, a BOE, um, you know, I think we're uh, appropriately uh, letting you as the uh, leader of our school district uh, with your, your strong partners uh, work through the multiple uh, solutions that you're having to develop. But I, I hope also that we can get recurring updates related to these costs, um, you know, transportation, Chromebook purchases, the microphones, PPE, uh, the, the personnel that are needed to support these changes. Uh, I, I'm glad we created, I think I shared this at our last meeting, the latitude to, to uh, make these adjustments um and and i think they're um, you know i have every confidence that as we hear them that you're making uh, excellent choices but i think it's important as a board that we're able to uh regularly uh, understand what the cost the related costs are thank you thank you uh maura you're up thank you uh just a quick sound check. Everyone hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. So uh, I'd like to reiterate to uh, everyone who has been working so hard this year in, in the, the district and, and also uh, the teachers who I know are uh, both looking forward to going back and, and fearful and to the parents who are looking forward to their kids returning to school and fearful. Um, that that uh, we you know I, I the process that everyone sees here is is uh, that we're all trying to work through this. Um, my, my first uh, questions are are kind of more related to the experiences in um, with with some of the the practices you've started to talk about and outline here. Um, in schools, but if they are too, if it's too soon to answer them or if, or if we should hold them, um, I totally understand that those may be answered in coming weeks. Um, ha, so the, the first one is, is related to, uh, I guess, whatever group of K through three students are going to be um, in, in the school eating lunch will students be eating lunch in the classrooms? Is that decided yet? Um, I, you know, you, uh, Dr. Harrison referred to uh, being able to still purchase lunches and, and the availability of free and reduced lunches, but will, where will kids be eating? All right, so I'll take that uh, quickly. So we're still obviously developing the school lunch plans. Louder. Okay, and um, we will definitely be offering lunch. We are required to do so by the governor and also by our participation in national school lunch. There will be probably some combination of classrooms and cafeteria at the elementary level, but we will be looking to use the cafeteria at the campus. Um, we are looking at f configuring seats to maximize the space, but still be six feet apart. That is the key that I will stress here tonight, that when we have children eating, they will be six feet apart so they can safely take off their masks. I'm looking at um, simplifying menus, um, putting packaging food so it's all prepared and ready to go, but clear, clear packaging so the children still can see what the choices are. We're looking at um, pre-ordering. There's a lot of work to do here. Uh, I am just getting back, um, work, working with Aramark, who just started back in August. So there's a lot here and details will be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stein. Also, I, I, I do wanna just note that also, you know, to the extent we're getting into the weeds on operational issues, there's, each building is gonna have their own unique challenges and operations. And I'm, I trust that the building principals and other building leaders will be addressing that in their individual communications with the parents and students for those schools, so. So um, as far as the, um, I know that this is very early stage with looking at kindergarten and first grade um, four, times, uh, four times a week potentially. Um, I'm curious though if the uh, staggered pick up and drop off that has been uh, described, so Dr. Harrison referred to it, 
as necessary to maintain safe distancing um, would impact the amount of time uh, that these youngest kids got to spend in school if we went with this option. So I, I heard a 2.5 hour school day. And I wondered if it would be the same amount of, um, as you called it, seat time available if we were doing the hybrid, hybrid model. Thanks. Yeah, we actually looked at that and it's identical. So there's, okay, so it is, so part of the reason that this is being considered is that you, it, it doesn't require any sort of loss of, of time. Right. I, I would say, I would supplement uh, Mary's response saying not only, it's not a loss of uh, what is in-person learning time. It's an equal amount of in-person learning time where we have the, what is critically important is that the entire school day um, is still alive and well here and that there is extension that will occur outside of the in-person learning that will be required time for, for distance learning for all those students to participate in some form of asynchronous independent learning activities um, that will be included in that cumulative necessary seat time. So if, um, thank you, Dr. Harrison. And if I can clarify that then, um, because I know, I know that uh, even as a, a board member, it requires a lot of catching up to understand uh, the terminology. What that means is in the time when kids are, the, those, those uh, smallest kids are not in school, that they would be asked to uh, do some work at home, which their parents could schedule the timing of that work. So asynchronous means they're not going to miss it on say um, a webcast? If, it's, if it involves being on screen, it's at a time that the family can choose? No, we're that's, not that's saying correct. that. We're not saying that there would be required engagement during the school day time. That student may complete something, submit something. There would be expectation that students would be working during the traditional school day. Um, oh, can you, uh, perhaps I can wait and we can get some further examples of this, how this might work as we go through future meetings. So I'm, I'm not fully sure that I understand, but clearly this is, this is um, still being organized. And it may just be that I'm not, I'm not hearing everything right now on the spot in the meeting, um, but thank you. Um, finally, the attendance piece. Um, so you've, what, what Dr. Harrison said, and I guess this is, this is related to kids needing to go through the bell schedule. Um, I, I just, I'm not sure that I understand what that looks like in each school. And perhaps that's also something that can wait to have some further discussion and uh, fleshing out of what that looks like is, uh, as the uh, school-based um, discussion of, of expectations goes forward? Is that something also for the future? Certainly is, is a part of the work that we're, we're doing, yes. So I guess, I guess what I'm looking at is there, there, were, um, there were certainly questions during emergency learning last spring where um, there could be concerns that kids of the age that it was appropriate to have expectations of their involvement on, so uh, in uh, online classroom sessions, that, there, that those expectations were muted because we knew that there were issues, home issues, issues with health and other matters that made this an emergency situation and so accountability was different. And I guess what I'm, I know that this is, I think, I think this is part of maybe what you've called an evolving um, set of, a, uh, that, that teachers will need to respond and understand what kids need because certainly there are still gonna be kids who are not thriving, say potentially, or not, not thriving in the same way when they're in the online sessions as they do in class or vice versa. And, um, but it sounds like once you add 
state requirements for attendance and following bell schedules and things like that in, it then becomes, you know, it's out, it's out of our hands. And how do we sort of sensitively address what, what kids need there? I hope that's not too involved of a question. Uh, I, it's, to me, it sounds like a doctoral dissertation to answer it, <laughs> okay. no offense, but, <laughs> okay. um, but frankly, um, we're going to have expectations in place that we didn't have in place before, and we're not going to stop being human beings. We're teachers of people before we are teachers of content and material, and that we're going to go out of our way to be able to accommodate um, needs of our families. And, you know, on tonight's agenda, I'm thrilled that the board is going to be appointing our second social worker. Uh, Julianne Austin, who from all accounts is a star. We're going to look for people like her, our counselors, our school administrators, our school psychologists are going to be partnering with families to support them through these different transitions and, and the difficult times. We need structures and we need systems. We need parents. They're going to have to be flexible. Everybody across the, the, the country is dealing with, with these transitions and these challenges. We're going to do the best we can to sort, support people. I understand that there's going to be transitions that uh, and changes that parents are going to have to make to adapt to these schedules. Um, we're doing the best we can. We're going to continue to support families and students to the best of our ability. We have more resources in the district than we have ever had before, um, and we're going to take advantage of them. Um, but, um, you know, to cut to the chase, we're going to have standards and expectations that we're going to have to follow, and we're going to have to obligate families and students to comply with them uh, to the best of their ability and where there are challenges, we will do our best to support them. Thank you for, thank you for that clarification. Um, last, um, so uh, as far as teachers as employees, um, so teachers have to have their days for illness and, and all, any other day that they, they need for, um, those, those things which they're uh, required contractually to have. We know that in every school year, uh, sometimes our children's teacher has to be away from the classroom. And I, I imagine, um, and we have, have talked um, certainly at the board level about the availability of substitutes and how, how tough, um, you know, certainly this is going to be tough for teachers. Uh, how much tougher is it going to be for substitutes? And I, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the thinking around, um, around teachers' time um, and how substitutes will be prepared this year. And that's my final question. Thank you. Well, um, certainly we respect and, and honor our teachers' um, right to, to take a personal day. Teachers are going to be sick. Um, it's inevitable that that is going to occur. So like we sh certainly should step back as a school community and not think that that is gonna change. We have human beings that have, have life that's gonna happen. When the, the one beauty of, of all of this craziness that we're dealing with is that a teacher can essentially plan for what an emergency day may look like. So we will have subs that we can train in all the routines and protocols in our respective school buildings and what the district practices and procedures will be. Um, but when they step into a classroom, um, they will be equipped to be able to facilitate the learning that the teachers have left um, behind to be able to support them. Um, so, you know, simply stated that there will be opportunities that we can engage kids through the use of technology and be able to deliver instruction, albeit different than when the regular classroom teacher is there, but that is no different than a, a typical school year. Um, it, there's going to be new complications that surface. Um, we may have some fewer subs available, um, but herein um, we will take advantage of, of the use of our building substitutes and other staff to make sure that student learning always continues. And could you, uh, uh, thank you, could you clarify what a building substitute is for any, any folks who are, are uh, want to understand that who maybe don't? Yeah, so traditionally substitutes work on a per diem basis and they're called in, it's like an on-demand position and they are at will employees. So um, they're appointed by the Board of Education to serve as substitutes and as an absence um, surfaces, they are assigned to work on a given day. We have building substitutes in each of our buildings that essentially are subs that we commit to working 
every day of the school year and we use them on a regular basis. So by, um, they are always on staff and there to support the operational needs of a school. Um, so we do have a number of those folks in district and those would be the first individuals that we of course would turn to. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, my understanding is that Erin is caught up with a work emergency, so she had to drop off. So uh, now that the trustees have had their chance to uh, have further discussion around this, uh, we'll move on to our consent agenda. And before we vote on it, are there any questions on the consent agenda? Okay, uh, b before I move forward on it, uh, just uh, I guess this is the time for our radio listeners to start dialing for concert tickets or to uh, start putting your name in the Q&A piece of, of the Zoom. So, because we'll be moving on to our second community comment period momentarily. So if you can now start to queue up with your name and address so we can recognize you when that period opens up shortly. Uh, I just also want to note a couple of things on the consent agenda. Uh, there's the approval of all of our coaches for this year. Obviously, we don't know uh, how the sports programs will be operating yet. We're still waiting guidance from the state on that, and there may need to be adjustments going forward. So I did want to point that out, that uh, that, that is obviously still in flux. And with, th with that, if I could get a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda, please. So moved. All in favor? Aye. There's one standalone agenda. Uh, item 13. Uh, item 13. Yeah, I'm getting there. Um, Yes, um, and now uh, if we can get a motion to approve a, a settlement of a litigation matter on item 13.1, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, anyone voting no? Anyone abstaining? Yes, yeah, you would, you would you're abstaining. abstaining. Yes. So thank so, you. So if I, if I could just say, um, before you turn to questions, um, I do want to um, acknowledge um, a few different um, actions that were taken with, um, on the board agenda this evening. Um, I was, I'm thrilled to welcome um, an incredible new leader uh, to our school district, Michelle O'Brien, uh, who will be our new assistant director of PPS. Um, so congratulations, Michelle. I believe Michelle is at home watching us and Michelle will be beginning tomorrow here in district. So we're thrilled to um, welcome Michelle and know she's going to be an amazing partner for uh, Ms. Krieger and all of our staff members across the district. We also are welcoming our um, second uh, social worker to the district, uh, Ms. Julianne Austin or Julie. Um, Julie is an amazing talent as well with a tremendous um, background and experience, so she's going to be an immediate impact here in our school uh, district. Um, we also tonight, um, the board has um, appointed um, a um, permanent athletic trainer, now a district employee for the first time, uh, Hannah Gross. Um, we know Hannah has have served as our athletic trainer for a number of years uh, through a contracted source, but now Hannah is truly uh, a bulldog of uh, being a direct employee of the Irvington School District. So uh, welcome, Hannah. Uh, we're thrilled to continue to have your partnership. Um, finally, um, when we think about the work that we're committed to this school year, um, the board authorized a, a contract with Castle, uh, which is our SEL partner that we'll be working with this school year. Um, so I, I want to thank the school community for their support in that work and that truly uh, underscores our commitment on, on that front and they will be engaging with us from day one. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, just a couple reminders, everyone, uh, to the extent you put questions in the Q&A, those will not be read to the audience. So if you have a question or comment that you'd like to make publicly, please put your name 
and address in the Q and A function function in Zoom. Also, to the extent there are going to be uh, multiple members from a family speaking, uh, please identify both of both of yourselves or however many there are uh, when you're making the comment, just so we can have that for the record, please. So with that, uh, we'll start Sorry, it off. Mr. Freeman, one more reminder. Yes. Just another reminder, please. You're going to receive two surveys. Please complete them. Yes, please. And please know that, um, that if some of your answers are real involved or if we become the place of redundant, um, we may look to include them on the Q&A or FAQ rather than having to go through deep detail and all of them. And we'll update that within the next couple days. And also, as always, you can send emails to the addresses that were listed in the presentation to get your questions answered that way as well. So with that, we go to Francis Bean, 11 North Broadway in Irvington. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. I wondered, just as a follow-up to no Maura's question about the K-1 um, requirements. So I guess the questionnaire is being sent out tomorrow. And I just, just as a parent of somebody who's going to first grade, um, Chris mentioned that, the, that some subjects will still be required to learn, be learned, you know, be, be required to be synchronous learning outside of the AM or PM times that the K-1 cohort would be meeting four days a week. So what would that mean? Like P, what kind of requirement on parents would that be? Francis Bean, thank you for asking that question, which I think I can answer a little bit more directly than, um, the broader question that Ms. Geddes asked, um, that when we think about the, um, the time that students would be in school and the time where there would be that synchronous direct instruction on Wednesdays with the classroom teachers, when we look at that, that time, that is when the core instruction and the core learning is going to occur. When we look back at the time that a child during the school day, when a child would not be in school, there would be learning that would continue. There may be some art projects. There may be independent reading and writing activities or some research that would occur. Things that would be appropriately self-directed, things that a child would be able to complete on his or her own at home. Um, so we're not thinking that, hey, you know, we're only gonna do math in, in ELA in school. No, there's gonna be other aspects of learning. Extensions of that learning will happen at home. Um, but the, the core instruction will happen with the teachers. Okay, and I just have one more question then about the fact that it wouldn't be second, third, fourth, and fifth grade too for this great idea of having four mornings a week. Um, I, I just wonder if it's possible, like if, if there was a setup where people raise money um, to like a parent like board, I don't know if there was enough money raised for like a core group of like volunteer helpers to come in and do the cleaning that you said was cost prohibitive for um, this to extend to the other elementary grades. Um, if that would be a possibility. I mean, if the community could come together and somehow answer the need, the call for the parents of working parents who have all these very young children, you know, that extends through fifth grade. I'm sorry, go through extends through third grade. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, you know, honestly, we, um, we, we don't have the capacity to be able to support that. And quite um, honestly, we also cannot accept volunteers and um, to be able to, to come and work our schools. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to be able to have many volunteers in school. There's going to be limited engagement from anyone outside of our school community. Um, there's not just the need for cleaning. Um, there are all other mechanisms that fall into that as far as how we feed kids, how transporting students. We're going from something where we're looking at a couple school buses to transport students considering the opt-outs and we're contemplating the transportation opt-outs in, in our per budget projections for transporting the K-1 students. That's gonna be a couple school buses or a few school buses that we're gonna have to run midday. If we were to expand that, there'd be multiple school buses that would increase this thousands upon thousands of dollars. 
So right now, this is, I'm going to be real transparent with everybody. This is what we're capable of doing. Um, if we find this to be successful and we can expand it through our experiences throughout the year, we'll come forward with those recommendations. But right now, we're not able to do more than we are today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And is the K-1 questionnaire being sent out tomorrow? Yes, it will. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Bye. Welcome. Uh, have a good night. Uh, next, we have Michelle Noyes, 49 Mallard Rise in Irvington. There we go. Okay, I see myself. Um, first of all, again, thank you. I recognize a lot of progression on this plan um, that I and other parents have been speaking about over these past few weeks. So I am really gratified to see that responsiveness to the community, um, recognizing, again, there are no easy answers here. Um, a few quick questions, because I'm sure plenty want to speak. Um, just bringing back an earlier point that was made, Saturday's election regarding the remote option is not fully binding, if I'm understanding this correctly, as there would be a second confirmation of that election coming midweek. Um, I'm conscious there's still developments to the plan being made and just want to be clear on what we need to commit to by when. Yes, you're correct. We, need, we would like you to express your interest on Saturday. And then by mid next week, you will get a communication from my office that would ask you to make what, you know, and I say this kind of lightly, like a binding commitment um, yeah. and obligate yourself, your child to what the plan will be for the start of the school year. So best effort Saturday, but if something new is revealed over the next following days, then we would consider that second binding um, as far as it's able to. Yeah, and I would say um, any revelations I would suspect would be occurring on your side on, on the school end because I don't think we're going to be presenting or releasing anything that's going to significantly alter perspectives from a, a school standpoint. Um, it would be that decision that you would have to make in your home at that point in time. Sure, we're going to have a meeting that will occur Thursday night, and that may influence some of your decisions, but we're not going to have any significant programming updates that are going to happen between now and the time which you would have to make a commitment. So there wouldn't be any firm direction on the K-1 plan, for example, as a parent of two rising first graders? There will not be. Okay. Um, secondly, if there's enough families in each grade to elect a fully remote option, would you consider uh, creating a remote cohort? And I recognize that fully depends on the numbers that you're looking at. Um, and perhaps I would just like to, you to take that under advisement. Yeah, I hear the, um, the question and understand why one would do that. It presents a whole nother uh, challenge for us from a, um, an organizational standpoint and an operational standpoint and my concerns sit truly with equity and that um, you're making a conscious decision to elect your child into a 100% distance learning. I responded with that recommendation to the Board of Education based upon hearing the community's feedback. Um, but frankly, we would, would not be prepared to move forward and commit to saying that we would have essentially what would be like a cohort D, if you consider what I outlined in earlier presentations. So right, I, I would say pretty strongly right now that it, that would not necessarily be a consideration. I want you to make that, cons that determination based upon the information that was presented to you tonight. Certainly, and I understand that. And, you know, I would just encourage you to remember that some of us have less choice in the matter when we're dealing with more vulnerable members of our family um, when making these um, decisions. But I do respect um, you setting expectations appropriately. Thank you. Um, and finally, I just want to ask if families do elect to end up fully homeschooling or going into a pod or you know private school options, are you concerned about the impact that this might have on future school budgets? As I understand that that's enrollment levels um, are taken into strong account? Uh, yeah, to some extent. Um, you know, aids come in in different ways. Some is formula-based that's driven by enrollment. Um, so that impacts the school district and the amount of state aid that we have. Um, so if, you know, I, I want to be clear that if someone was to homeschool, you're taking on the responsibility of educating your child it's not just a matter of making a decision and withdrawing your child. 
You have to have a curriculum that you, that you plan you, that has to be approved by the school district. There are um, quarterly reports that you have to submit to the school district that have to be approved. Um, so there's, there's obligation on, on a family side. Um, but when we look at a school district side, yes, if we had large number of folks that withdrew their, their children, it could potentially have negative effects on uh, state funding. Um, and that should be a concern to all Arvington residents um, because it would affect the bottom line uh, of the revenues of our school district. Okay, yep, and of course, unfortunately, there's no easy options, um, whichever direction one goes. But I do appreciate your continued um, support. Look forward to seeing the developments and receiving the survey tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Melissa Jones at 15 South Dutcher Street in Irvington. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Um, well, first, I just wanted to say how thankful and excited I am to see these options added to the plan. It really speaks a lot to the district and the board's willingness to, to hear the community and really be flexible. It's, it's really, really great to see and makes me feel really happy. Thank you so much for this. Um, I was also happy to hear your comments, Dr. Harrison, about um, you know, the distance learning option and how learning in classrooms and learning in virtual classrooms can be different, that there's, you know, differing opinions and differing research about effectiveness and which, which may be richer or not. Um, and I think that the hearing, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's Miss Alice or Dr. Alice, I don't want to uh, <laughs> misappropriate your um, uh, doctorate level there, but it was really great to hear you talk about the, you know, innovation and creativity that curriculum instruction is going to bring to making both experiences really rich and really great. So that's awesome to hear. I did want to uh, just ask one question, you know, I was part of bringing forth a petition to, to try to, um, advocate for this distance learning option and you know we had over 200 signatures of community members who were really interested in having this option made available um, so they're going to be very happy to hear this news tonight but the ask was actually to make the option available to parents and to teachers and so i was wondering if i could just hear a little bit about you know whether or not teachers are going to be presented with a choice and if not whether we have any concerns about the impact of that on on teacher retention or um, you know whether we have any concerns in terms of like a response from the teachers union or our beloved staff members who take such great care of our kids every day. Well, thank you for the positive feedback, and, and we're glad to have presented this opportunity tonight. Um, I'd like to to begin by addressing that um, there's no bigger fan of Irvington teachers than Chris Harrison. Um, these are people that I am proud to be able to call um, col colleagues. Um, they're people that I'm proud to work beside. Um, you know, teachers and superintendents for that matter, um, we have responsibilities to fulfill. And that when we think of the work that we're doing in our schools, our obligation is to be here to be able to teach our students. When we think of our teachers that have health needs, um, like in any other field, um, individuals can apply for accommodations and we would consider them. But when we're thinking about balancing the quality of experience and the type of experiences that, that we have for our children, um, I, I, I struggle a little bit with um, some of the points that are being made and that we're almost arguing both sides of this, that the argument that's being made or the request that has been made is that there, we should have um, children in school for in-person learning more. But at the same time, we can't do that without our teachers here because essentially it turns into kids being in school and teachers being home and it's like a, a whole reverse scenario. Um, so that necessarily doesn't play out. Um, you know, there's difficult decisions that we all have to make. And I wanna support my teachers, um, some of the greatest people there are and um, we're gonna work with everybody to accommodate their needs. Um, but unfortunately, our business is here in the school district. And those that have needs that we can accommodate, we certainly will. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some that we can't. Um, but we're gonna fulfill all of our obligations to make the school environment safe. If the school environment is going to be as safe as it can be for children, it's gonna be as safe as it can be for staff. And, and that's what our commitment is. 
um, I'm going to support our my colleagues. Um, but my my duty is to run the school district in accordance with the plans and the board policies and the direction that's set forth by the state of New York. And a part of that is people being here to do their jobs. Um, so unfortunately, we cannot provide such a latitude at this time. But um, know that um, we're, we do everything that we can to support the needs of our faculty and staff. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Fetner to Cindy Lane. And uh, Jay, I believe uh, Michael can be found under Lori Fetner. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Um, our question is similar to the one that was just asked a few minutes ago. Uh, we're, we're very happy to hear that you're offering the option for parents to opt in to 100% remote learning, but we're concerned that the way it was presented, uh, it's kind of being set up to fail because you're going to have kids that are 100% remote that are kind of being ignored while the kids that are in class get most of the attention. And it seems kind of like, like it, it was almost purposely set up that way to, to uh, ignore those kids that are 100% re remote. We don't really understand what the challenge is in having those cohorts or those fully uh, dedicated remote options available if there's enough interest from the parents. Say you get 20 plus kids per grade uh, that are opting to be 100% remote. Why couldn't you then just set up those dedicated classes of fully remote kids, which would then have a much higher quality experience uh, since the teachers would be geared towards those 100% remote kids? So, I mean, I, I know Dr. Harrison spoke to this about some of the challenges and uh, there's, uh, first I want to say, I, I don't agree that the remote option is being set up to fail, but I do think we need to be realistic about the differences between 100% remote option and an option where you're in school part of the day. There are differences. I think anyone who's ever uh, you know, I think our, our meetings as a board are better when we're all here in the room interacting with each other than when we're doing it via Zoom, but sometimes that's what we're reduced to. So I, I personally wouldn't agree with that. I do think, uh, though, we want people to go into this with their eyes wide open in terms of the differences and the, and the limitations in a fully remote models because there's only... Uh, there's, there's just limitations around it. But in terms of, you know, the question around a dedicated cohort, uh, yeah, I think that brings up a, several operational challenges just from, you know, from my view. And I would, I would say, uh, if that was to even be considered, I think there'd have to be an even greater commitment from the parents to stay in that model because, you know, just thinking it through, if you got to a point where, you had 20 kids who were in a class where it was fully remote. The, te the, every, the schools could be arranged or the grade will be arranged that way to accommodate that, but you're not gonna be able to, I don't think it'd be uh, operationally feasible to then say at Christmas time, no, now 12 of those people wanna go back into classes and you're only gonna have eight kids continue in that. You're now gonna have classes that are gonna have more kids in it. It's gonna burden the other teachers. There's, a lot of operational complexities around it. I'm just scratching the surface. And then there's been discussion around that, but that's just one thing that comes to mind. So, and it's also obviously significantly different at the elementary level versus the secondary level where you have only you know, one or two teachers sometimes who are teaching a subject and they need to be in class to support the, the kids who are here in person. So, I mean, there's numerous challenges around it. And, and you know, we, we understand that people are interested in it, but uh, it may not be something that's feasible for a multitude of reasons. Okay, I mean, that, that makes sense, but at the elementary level, if you had parents willing to commit for half a year or the full year, do you think you could consider offering that option if the parents are willing to commit? I, I would say at this point, uh, it's not a recommendation that's, uh, that's being made, uh, and that's just some of the initial challenges around it. I know there are others, so, uh, Look, as we said, though, this is a constantly evolving process. Uh, as we look at the models and the people in terms of what they're looking to do, we may evolve it at this point. I, I would say that the model that's being discussed is the one that people have to be prepared to move forward with or, or not, because at this point, uh, that's where we're at. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we have Clifford Mays, 12 North Cottonet in Irvington. Uh, hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Cliff. Okay, great. Uh, very grateful for all of you for all the hard work uh, you've done on this presentation. It's really very much appreciated. And I know this is an evolving situation. So thank you all very much. Um, my question is, is there an, like, an official threshold being set by the district for a scenario where there are new COVID positive staff or students uh, in the fall? And if that threshold got met, the district would go back to the 100% distant learning? And how will you monitor that medically on a daily basis? There's specific standards that are going to be defined uh, that we'll publish on our website um, by the 21st of October. Um, those are all details that we're working on um, with the um, Department of Health and our school physician. Uh, did, you, did you say the 21st of October? Oh, I'm sorry, August. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, that, that's appreciated. And uh, a second question, which is directed uh, more towards the upperclassmen. Um, what is the school planning to do to support uh, like the seniors and juniors to help them navigate through the process of graduating onto higher learning uh, during the COVID era? And as this all evolves, both at the high school level and then even the college level as the colleges are evolving their you know, requirements as well. Yeah, so we're going to adapt to, to the evolving field um, that we're continuing to provide all of the um, high level courses um, that our students are interested in taking. We are looking to continue to provide all of our um, rich enrichment um, type experiences what uh, co curricular activities student leadership opportunities to ensure that our students have those experiences. Um, we are going to prepare our children. To, to move on to college and be as successful as everyone one, um, wants them to be. Um, the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have to think that children all across the, the country, kids all across our region are having the same effects and that um, it's gonna, the college process is gonna look and feel different um, than it did two years ago and hopefully then it'll look two years from now. Um, but we are gonna continue to collaborate with our colleges um, we are going to prepare our students. We're going to provide the level of programming and guidance that we typically do. I think one sign of that back in the spring is that we facilitated um, a number of our traditional college preparation programs, um, education programs for students and parents. We did so virtually. Um, so we're going to adapt and we're going to make sure that our kids are ready to go and that they can pursue their, their dreams and get into the, the schools of their choice. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the survey. And again, very grateful for all the work you guys have done. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have RJ Hotai. I do not believe they're still here. Okay, uh, thank you, Jay. Next we have Peter Nolan. Peter, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I can't, you can't hear me because I don't have a microphone. We can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, you can, all right. Uh, if you could just please provide your address, please. Yes, at 66 Mountain Road, Irvington. Go ahead. And my question is regards to if a child gets uh, or is tested positive for COVID, are they, are they able to uh, be in online learning because they would have to be in quarantine for 14 days. It doesn't seem to be effective to have them out for that long if the online learning is in place. Yes, um, a student will be able to participate in the distance learning program. So as long as he or she are well enough to be able to do it. In cases where a child was too ill 
or a child had an injury would look like a, another situation that we uh, that we would we could have um, during the course of the school year where theoretically we could um, provide some additional support um, through home instruction and the like if a, a child was hospital bound for example uh, but no a child would certainly be able to participate in distance learning so as long as he or she were able okay that's uh, great uh, that was not clear in the last presentation I didn't hear anything said about it as of yet so thank you very much to everyone uh, it has been, uh, it's very impressive to see it all getting done so quickly. Thank well, you. Thank you and, and you're welcome. And next we have Laura Coronado, 118 East Sunnyside Lane in Irvington. Hello. Hello, go ahead, please. Hi, um, I would like to make the comment that I think the timeline to decide on remote schooling is too short, especially when we don't have all the info in yet. Um, also, my question is, um, will all the classrooms have AC and filters by opening day? Yeah, so unfortunately, the, the timeline is what it is, and I, I'm proud to be able to offer it to folks. Um, and I, I, if you're interested, I hope you take advantage of it. And if you don't do so initially, you'll have other opportunities throughout the course of the school year. Yes, classrooms will have the necessary filters um, and um, by the start of school, and um, all classrooms will have air conditioning uh, by that. Oh. So. Okay, and my other question is, if we have a medical exemption, will the distance learning also not as, as robust as it will be for the other opt-out? And if so, is that equitable? It would be the same as the other option that was introduced tonight. tonight. Get a lesser experience if we had a medical exemption? that would be the experience that would be available to students who had a, uh, any kind of medical accommodations. Okay. I don't, I don't think that that's fair for um, those children who may have a medical exemption mm -hmm. and be unable to attend. Okay, thank you. Okay. Next, we have Kathy Byfield, 3 Maple Street. Hi, everybody. Could you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, um, first of all, I just, I'll keep it short. I wanted to thank everybody for all of your work and um, especially for listening to the community um, for the kindergarten and first grade parents. Um, I, we're really excited about this and the possibility of this. Um, I just wanted to get back to what Dave said earlier. Is there a way we could reconsider surveying only Dow's Lane parents about the busing? I have yet to talk to a, a parent who wants to put an elementary school kid on a bus. If we could get that number down, really get it down, um, is there a possibility second and third graders could also go the AM PM sessions? And I know you, Chris, you mentioned it was thousands and thousands of dollars and the, that there's staffing issues. Could we just be more specific? I mean, could we raise money for this to be implemented at all of Dow's Lane? We have parents there with siblings. I have a first grader and a third grader. You know, a lot of people are in that boat. Um, I just wanted to know if that was a possibility to put that in the survey tomorrow instead of the Ardley survey, which sounds like it's just going to ask everybody in the whole district and also might go to a spam folder. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Byfield. Um, you know, transportation participation is going to be way down. Um, so that will affect our costs to be able to run the midday uh, routes that we're referencing. Um, so we've already projected what that may look like. Um, so when we think of those certain dollars that when we think 40 some thousand dollars per bus uh, estimate for the, those additional routes. Um, but when we think about um, all the other all the other routes that we have we're not going to have to save money be, by looking at reducing routes in the morning because we have a base contract with our transportation provider 
and we're obligated to make those base payments so as long as school is open. Um, so there would not be that level of savings. Trust that we've taken the, the steps and we have from our surveys going back a, couple, uh, a month ago, we have a good indication um, that we know that we're gonna have roughly, um, we're projecting 38% of our families participate in transportation services, um, which will be a great drop from where we are now. Um, but that will not reduce all of our uh, base costs. Um, and we're utilizing those figures to be able to project where the, uh, the midday runs would be. Uh, we just don't have the capacity of the, of the funds available to do it now. Again, if the opportunity presents further down the road, it'd be something that we could explore. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next we have Cheryl and David Brand. Brandwine of 85 South Buckout Street in Irvington. Which was cheated. No, they, they commented, that friend commented earlier. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I erroneously emailed, the, I sent, posted a question earlier and it, I apologize. Um, firstly, I wanna thank the, the board and the, the staff of the district for all their extremely hard work during this very difficult time. We, we, we really, yeah, appreciate your, your effort and hard work very much. Um, we, we, we have a, uh, we have family members that are, that are, that are, that are, would be categorized as in, 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 a, in a risk pool uh, of, of uh, and we are concerned that by putting our children in the school, there's potential for, to, 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 to have a, a crisis in, in our family. So we want to understand what, what the implications of, in, of, of classroom learning mean. So we're willing to put our children in the classroom provided it's safe, but if, if, if there's any hint of, of, of danger, we, we would wanna reconsider that decision. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable request to, to, to have an option at some point, if there's an illness, to, to, to reconsider um, yeah, the, 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 the potential of, 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 of distance learning at some point. Uh, I, I think reopening the schools is, is, is somewhat of an experiment, albeit a, a noble experiment, but, but it's still an experiment and considering the, this, the, the situation in, in, in the world today. Uh, and, and I think that, the, the, that it seems quite kind of absolute to us that we can't uh, reconsider the decision of putting our children in the school at some point in the future. And I understand that there's 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 logistics involved and there's and, and that it's it's not so simple but I I, I I I don't think it's crazy to ask that question yeah thank you i i think the the one um the one consideration and and flexible and latitude that could be extended would be in and around health needs and with the with we would in those in such cases we would require medical documentation and it wouldn't be any kind of simple process. It would be something that we'd have to, to seriously consider um, and, and really review with you and engage um, probably our physicians um, for, their, for their guidance and expertise. And um, you know, I, I know you and I know your family, I, like so many others in the community, and I know the sincerity that you bring to the table. Um, and, and I don't want to undermine that. Uh, what, what does concern me though is I do, we have to have a legitimate system and a process and we have to honor that system and process because unfortunately um, we know that some people will go to measures that we, we don't respect to try to gain accommodations um, that would work in their favor. So we need to make sure that we have a thorough process, that we have established rigorous criteria and that if there was ever to be an ex an ex any kind of exemption or exception, um, that we would have to have some strenuous review associated with it. Okay, thank you. Next we have Dan Weiss, 53 Hillside Terrace in Irvington. And, and Jay, I'm gonna say that uh, I believe Dan is logged in potentially under Sarah. You got me, I think. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep, go yep. ahead, please. Oh, fantastic. Uh, firstly, just wanna say again, uh, thank you, Dr. Harrison and everyone for your hard work. 
Uh, really appreciate it. These are difficult choices. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't envy the position that you guys are in having to make these decisions. Um, I really want to echo some of the sentiments earlier from uh, my neighbors, Francis and Kathy, talking about extending the K-1 option to second and third grade. Uh, really glad as a parent of a rising kindergartner that you are uh, looking at this option, want to advocate for it. I, I, you know, I think about the ability of my not quite five-year-old to not even make it through a Star Wars movie, uh, you know, sitting through three days in front of a screen. And I think it's asking a lot of him and it's asking a lot of his, his teachers. Uh, so I appreciate you looking at this other option. Uh, and, and as also the parent of a rising second grader, uh, the concept of different models at the same school sounds very complicated. I understand from the previous answer that it's around cost and busing. Um, I'm curious, so you said, uh, Dr. Harrison, earlier 38% of, uh, approximately 38% are looking at busing. Uh, is that a similar number for Dow's Lane? Uh, and then also, are there any other logistical issues outside of the busing and cost that would keep us from extending this to second and third graders? Yeah, so um, I'll answer the, the first portion of that, and I'll then defer to, to Carol Stein, our Assistant Superintendent for Business and, and Operations, on some of the other specifics. Um, you know, so when we, we talk about um, the costs associated with it and the need for cleaning and those challenges that occur during the school day. Um, but there's also the significant congestion that occurs at dismissal and arrival, which is worrisome that we would have in the middle of the day, a dismissal occurring and an arrival occurring that would be a convergence of essentially the whole school community. And there, I would have significant concerns with respect to the ability to provide for the necessary um, social distancing. Um, and that also introduces um, layers of concern and additional staffing need that we don't have to be able to supervise all of those students. Um, because quite honestly, we would have to shut down the entire campus to give all of our staff lunch breaks, give um, others other um, breaks that are contractually or legally obligated. And we wouldn't have staff available to supervise that volume of students departing or arriving. So there's health and safety concerns and just human resource uh, limitations that would go far beyond the transportation and cleaning constraints that I referenced earlier. Um, Carol, I don't know if there's anything you want to supplement with the, the anticipated data from transportation? The early results are that about 50% will be opting out, so it's not 38.4, whatever that, that number from previous, the early survey, it's about 50. So um, it's a little bit, it's, you know, it's not as high as, I mean, it's high, it's high, it's high number. It's a good number, but we still have to be mindful of the cost and, and I'll be working on all of that, so. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Amy Chen at 160 Field Point in Irvington. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, Go ahead, thank please. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, I have two quick, uh, two questions. First of all, on the kindergarten first grade AM PM model, considering that uh, it's already decided to do hybrid um, AB for the other grades, for families that have kids across grades, that essentially seems to me to defeat the purpose of having cohorts to limit the exposure and for social distancing. Um, I, I don't know if that's been considered or please consider that. And the second part is on 100% uh, distance option. Thanks again. I'd like to uh, echo everyone. Thanks again for providing that option. Uh, the easier question first, um, Dr. Harrison said earlier, parents would need to commit for the marking period. Sorry for my ignorance, but is the marking period essentially just a semester? So we would commit through January and then come spring semester, we up again. So I'll answer your questions in reverse order. Um, that when you think of a marking period, think of the, the school days and 180 school days being the school year, the elementary 
Um, schools are divided into trimesters, so split that into thirds, approximately 60 days. And the secondary schools are broken into quarters, so we'd be looking at 45 days. Um, so you could do the, the, the rough math on, on that. Um, with then going back to thinking about um, the cohorts as it relates to the a, um, a B scenario and uh, the intersection with the, the possible model that we're exploring for K1. Um, certainly the cohorting, um, when we think of an elementary school, isn't the entire A cohort. When we think of a cohort, it is the individual class is the cohort. So you can think of a cohort as being um, 20 kids in a class, or when you think of it being split into A and B, roughly 10 kids in a class. The cohort is the 10 kids. Certainly where we look at the cohort A and cohort B being consistent throughout the district, that is really a convenience plan for families to try to have your children aligned with similar schedules. Unfortunately, that, and I think it was asked by one of our um, fellow community members a little bit earlier, that um, this does break down that convenience approach, that there would be potentially families that have children that would be in grades K and one that would be attending school for a half day, four days a week, and they'd have another child that could, would be in one of the higher grades that would be attending school two days a week, full days in person, and their schedules would not align. We fully acknowledge that, um, but I believe that our planning and our approach from a health and safety per perspective is still sound because we're still keeping those individual students within controlled cohorts for the purpose of limiting contact and spread and to be able to support responsible contact tracing. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, I appreciate that. And just to clarify, basically for Dow's Lane, the, marketing, the marking periods would be about 60 days? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then a, a uh, question also on 100% option, uh, kind of building on what's been asked before and also your presentation from other parents. Um, yes, I understand the 100% distancing is not the full experience of in school, but it is the all the experience of the remote portion of your hybrid model, at least, where all the resources provided to in-school hybrid learners would be provided to at-home learners. So when you mentioned earlier, for example, if the hybrid kids get a care package of, I don't know, workbook, textbooks, whatever, I assume that would be provided to the in-home student as well? I think your question articulated my point very well, and I thank you for asking it. Uh, yes. Um, that is accurate, and, um, and I would um, maybe just add another layer to it by reinforcing that students will have the same curricular objectives, same curricular experiences, albeit less the in-person learning component. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, ju just a note, uh, if there's anyone who hasn't had a chance yet to ask a question this evening, and would like to do so, uh, please go to the Q&A now since we're getting towards the end of the queue. And with that, uh, we have Erin Gorman, 26 Hudson Avenue. Hi, I missed the beginning of the meeting. So if this was addressed before, I apologize. Was Irvington's reopening plan approved yet by the state? nobody's plans have been approved to my knowledge. So, okay. um, you know, I've been in communication on a regular basis with people from the Department of Health who are actually doing the review on behalf of the governor's office. Um, there have been no questions posed um, to, to, you know, I, I'm sure there's always that possibility that school districts could receive feedback on a plan. Typically, it's not an approval or denial. They're not going to approve or deny our model for um, delivery of instruction. They're going to look to make sure we have the necessary safeguards and protocols in place that would be compliant with the DOH guidance. Steady, State Education Department similarly is going to look at the standards they set forth in their 145 page guidance document. Um, but again, so as long as we are providing what is um, a loose definition of what equitable um, instruction looks like and that there's equal access for all students uh, I don't foresee there being any challenges from state ed. Um, so I'm confident that we're in a good position with our plan. Um, and, um, you know, certainly at some point in time, look forward to, to receiving that, 
that official approval. Okay, and just with the testing, I also heard Governor Cuomo's press conference last Friday, and I was surprised by you know, the responsibility for testing he placed on the school districts. He made it seem that districts needed a testing protocol in place by this Friday. So, I mean, you're saying that there's no way Irvington can test students, and I do agree, but is there a chance that our reopening plan could be denied based on not having those no. testing protocols? No, we're, the, the plan that we're putting in place is one that was developed with the uh, Westchester County Department of Health. They acknowledge the limitations that, that I spoke of earlier and not having the ability to administer testing. What it is, is we have to outline the protocols and how someone is gonna be directed for testing. And we will have that information posted on our website by the, the necessary compliance date. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next we have Michelle Soto, 29 Hamilton Road, Irvington. Michelle, you should be able to unmute. Michelle, you there? Jay, I, I, I take it she's still yeah. as a participant, correct? She's able to speak, uh, but there's no sound coming through. Yeah, she, she noted that she's having computer troubles. Should she write her question? No. I would say, Michelle, if you have a question, feel free to email it to board at irvingtonschools.org and um, we'll respond as soon as possible. Apologize that you're not able to um, connect with us this evening because of your technical glitch. Yeah, and if, if you're able to resolve that before we finish the period, let us know and we'll come back to you. So we have Lisa Waters, 25 Pine Lane, Irvington. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for all this information, um, all the details, wonderful. Um, we're just starting to see some stories come out where schools are not able to open due to um, not having enough staff <laughs> or teachers. Um, because of medical reasons or childcare leaves, what's your confidence that we have enough staff and teachers to open in September? At this point in time, I'm very confident that we have the staff that we need to open. We have received some requests for accommodations from teachers, we're reviewing them. Many of them will result in accommodations on site, not requiring teachers to be off site. So in terms of uh, our faculty, we're fine. Okay, great. That's, that's great to hear. Thank you so much and have a great night and thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who hasn't had a chance yet to ask a question this evening uh, that would like to do so? And I would just maybe expand upon uh, Mary's response and thank you, Mary. I just want to say, you know, um, I just want to thank IFA, which is the Irvington Faculty Association. They've really been incredible partners in this work. Um, we are all facing difficult times, difficult decisions, and uncertain, scary times. Um, but IFA leadership have been great partners. Every single IFA member has really worked hard with us and are dedicated to serving the needs of your children. The um, staff really stepped forward. Um, we've had a number that have volunteered throughout summer months to, to participate in staff development. We had dozens and dozens of staff members that sat on and served on our reopening committees where they volunteered their time. It's a difficult time for all of us, 
but they have been incredible partners. They have been a part of our process um, from the beginning. Um, I have been meeting with them periodically and um, we have district-wide um, Google Meets or Google Hangouts that I call Hangout with Chris. Um, we'll have another one of them next week. And um, they give us great feedback. They ask really good questions, just like the parent community. They are strengthening our process and, and leading us to having better plans to serve your kids. Um, so when the questions surface, I know I spoke about them before, um, but the IFA um, as an organization, um, and then each of the members have been great partners. And I would say similarly for our wonderful administrators association, our clerical association, and our custodial unit. Um, super people, so committed to our schools. Again, we are lucky to have each and every one of them here in Irvington. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, next we have Larry O'Grodnick, 15 South Dutcher Street in Irvington. Hey, thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Harrison and the school board for listening to the feedback from families and offering an opt-in for 100% remote learning. I know this was a big concern for a lot of parents, so it's really great to see it addressed. And thanks for staying up so late to listen to even more feedback from parents. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, as another parent expressed, it is concerning to hear the representation tonight of remote learning as inherently worse than in-person learning, especially when all students are going to have the majority of their time learning remotely, even with the hybrid model. It would be great um, if we could figure out how to make remote learning better for all students rather than treat it as a secondary thing um, to the limited in-person instruction. I really want to second Laura's concerns and ask if the deadline for opting in shouldn't be pushed until after the meetings on health and safety. Um, specifically, the last meeting is August 20th for that. So just to clarify, we're asking parents to decide whether to opt in through remote learning before they have the details of the health and safety protocols. Is there a way to get the information sooner so that parents can make an informed decision uh, before the deadline? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Um, again, working backwards, um, I haven't established the, the final date when you have to make the commitment and understanding the point that you made with um, the ability to gather more information related to health and safety protocols in the school. I hear that and I'll give that consideration in planning. Um, certainly, we need information and data to make our decisions as soon as possible. You make a great point that I'll consider in our process. Um, when I think about um, the difference between distance learning and in-person learning, you just heard me sing the praises of our teachers. And we're not gonna beat having your kids in the classroom with them. They, they work magic. We're not gonna get a better education otherwise. We're gonna provide a good education, distance learning, remote-wise, and the hybrid. Um, and, but you know, it's not gonna match what the, the, the IFA stars can do uh, in person. Um, so, I'm sorry that that's the case, um, but that's, I think, the reality, and you're going to find that similar experience in any school that you go to. Um, but I stand next to my teachers that so you're not going to beat what they can provide um, with an in-person experience. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have Melissa Uccellini, 139 Field Point Drive in Irvington. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, um, again, thank you to everyone um, for working so hard on all of this um, in very difficult circumstances. Um, one quick question, if you um, implement the K-1 four-day model, would the drop-off and pickup times conflict with Main Street School, or would that be a consideration? No, uh... I'm just, I, I'm processing it um, in the times and the runs. Um, I, I, I don't think that will be the case. When we are creating those drop-off times and protocols, we're going to be aligning them across the district. Um, so it's a good question to ask, and, but one that, um, something that we're gonna have to be mindful of, that we're gonna have multiple drop-off times, we're gonna have times for walkers to arrive and the bus times. So we're gonna have to make sure that parents can fit into the given windows 
um, at the respective schools, but I don't foresee there being a conflict, conflict between Main Street and, and Dow's at all because there's enough time between the school, uh, the school start times. Okay, and then one other um, question. So if you implement the, the non um, four day model for the K-1, I'll have three kids doing distance learning at the same time as I have a parent um, working from home. And I'm very concerned that my internet connection is not gonna be able to handle that kind of traffic. Um, and I totally understand you not wanting to record sessions but I foresee this being a big problem that one or more of my kids is gonna get kicked off mm -hmm. uh, the live stream. So just what would be the, the solution to I, that? I would, yeah, so uh, two things. One, um, I, I'm committing to the community that we're gonna support you with, with, with internet and devices. And you, know, uh, you may choose to increase your bandwidth at home. If families do not have access to the internet, we will support those families. When we said about earlier about um, not recording um, learning sessions, um, we have not come up with a final plan about us recording them. But what I, what I was trying to clarify earlier is that um, parents and students are forbidden from recording them or taking photographs from, from those particular sessions. Um, the district may choose to record them on our own to then um, have them available as an inventory for use at a, um, for kids to refer to at a later date or students that were ill. Um, but that, that is, those are details that we have yet to finalize, but we have the ability to do so. And that's something that we, could, we are exploring, but don't have a final plan set for yet. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next we have Stephanie Fonseca, 25 Isler Lane in Irvington. Hi, thank you so much for everything you have done and for listening to the community. Um, I really appreciate it as do, I think, uh, several um, families in the district. I have two very simple um, questions. Hopefully they're simple. Um, the first is there's been a, kind of a mention of cohort C, uh, which are students in special classes. And I was wondering if these students will be intermingling with cohort A or cohort B at any point. And then my second question, just to get it out of the way, is um, for the K-1 new proposal with cohort A and cohort B doing AM and PM, will cohort A just be A through L and cohort B be M through Z? So for your first question about um, our special class students, um, I will confirm, but it is my understanding that they will be um, a separate cohort on their own throughout the day. There are sometimes situations where special class students um, partake in activities with other students, but I, I'm gonna need to confirm that for you. And then uh, your other question in terms of the cohorts, yes, it would remain as the alphabetic split so that that way we are limiting the number of students who are exposed to each other at any given time. Great, thank you so much, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, going once, going twice, uh, going three times, I thank you all for participating tonight in the meeting and for your questions and feedback. We do appreciate it. Uh, with that, uh, our next meeting is August 25th, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. And with that, if I can get a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Good night.